Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, Strategic Planning uh, Council Committee of the Whole uh, for April 17th, 2023. Um, there has been an agenda that has been circulated. Um, would anybody be willing to, uh, or is there anybody willing to motion that or add to or remove from that agenda? I so move as presented. Thank you very much. All those in favor? And that's carried. And I should mention that all public meetings are live streamed and recorded. Any verbal or written information provided may be included in public documents as per the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, FOIP 40-1. Also, the uh, minutes of the last Strategic Planning uh, Committee meeting were, uh, were circulated. Would there be any errors or omissions to note? If not, I would look for a motion to accept those minutes as circulated. Uh, Councillor Swanson, thank you very much. All those in favour? And that's carried. So that brings us into our agenda for today. I believe we have uh, a delegation waiting online. We would need a motion to uh, permit um, electronic attendance. Councillor Ratcliffe, all those in favour? And that's carried. Well, I would say uh, good morning to uh, our folks uh, folks online. Um, uh, can you hear us there? You bet. Yeah. Good morning. Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, we'll start with maybe a round of introductions of uh, who's here today, and then uh, we'll turn it across to Mr. Martinson after that, I believe. So um, go ahead, uh, Councillor Graham. Hello, I'm Sydney Graham, Councillor for Division 2. Uh, good morning, Jordan Northcott, Division 4 Councillor. Welcome, Jenny Melhoff, Division 1 Councillor and Deputy Reeve. Good morning, Daryl Lougheed, Councillor for Division 3 and Reeve. Good morning, Neil Radcliffe, Division 5. Good morning, Councillor Brian Cermak for Division 6. Hello, Division 7 Councillor Michelle Swanson. Good morning, Mary Hagen, Director of Corporate Services. Good morning, Rhonda Sirhan, Manager of Financial Services. Good morning, Rick Emmons, CAO. Good morning, Kirk Magnus, Director of Public Works Operations. Good morning, Matt Martinson, Director of Agriculture and Community Services. Good morning, Anne-Marie Bertignoli, Supervisor, Community Services and Agricultural Production. Well, great. We're, we're uh, really excited to hear what you have to say, for, say with us this morning. If you would maybe just give a, a brief introduction of your, yourselves at, out in, uh, out in the uh, virtual, virtual world. Absolutely. Hey, I'm, I'm Crystal Lilly. I'm, I'm calling in today from, from Treaty 6 Territory. I'm, I'm located in Edmonton, and I'm one of the partners with Hatley Group. I'll, I'll introduce what Hatley Group is in a minute, but we'll, we'll just um, do, do a little round table with our, our team next. Um, next beside me is Laura, if you want to introduce yourself. Good morning, I'm Laura Couric. I am located in Calgary in Treaty 7 Territory, and I'm Hatley Group's Project and Engagement Coordinator. Anine, why don't you say hi? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anine Vonkman. I live on Ruxton Island, just southeast of Nanaimo on unceded Salish, Coast Salish territory, and uh, previously from Alberta. And my name is Anna Rebus, and I also live in Calgary, and I'm the uh, interpretive lead for this project. Well, should, well, super. We... Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. And, and with that, I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to you to uh, introduce or, or Mr. Martinson, did you want to go first or? Okay, well, we'll go ahead, please. Crystal, go ahead. Clear? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'm hoping you all can, can see our, our slide presentation today. Um, I'll start by, by talking a little bit about Hatley Group really quickly. So Hatley Group is an Alberta-based consulting firm. 
with a focus on strategy, policy, um, and museum practice. Are you Crystal, okay? we're having a bit of trouble yeah. with the audio feed here. We're getting an echo. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to see if it's uh, our end or your end. Okay. Is it better if I hold the mic a little closer? Th that's better right now, for sure. Okay. Okay, we'll do this. A little awkward, but it'll do. Um, so uh, Hatley Group, as I was saying, is an Alberta-based consulting firm with a focus on strategy, policy, and museum practice. We guide not-for-profits and public sector organizations through projects to help them work more effectively and strategically and in service to their communities in a sustainable way. It's my, my pleasure to, to introduce my team here and everybody has, has um, told you who they are. I, I'll just um, really quickly say what we all do on the project. So um, Laura is our, our very capable project manager. Um, Anna Rebus is our interpretation specialist, and so she's been responsible for developing our interpretation themes and, and all of the research that'll go into the stories that are told in the exhibitions. Um, Anine Vonkman is our graphic and exhibit designer, and I'm the, and I'm the project lead. Um, so we can switch to our first slide. All right, so, pardon me. All right, so what you're seeing is a, is a summary of the project activities for phase one. So this is a two-phase project. Um, phase, phase one was strategy, community engagement, business planning, and interpretive planning. And now, we're, and now we have begun, um, you know, sort of around December, January, we began the work into phase two, which is the actual development of the Chris, exhibition. Daryl here again. Um, were we yeah. supposed to be seeing a screen with the... Uh, oh, hopefully you're seeing our screen. PowerPoint. The, the PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, Tra so Tracy said she had it up. Would okay. you like us to share? I, I think I'll we'll have to do the share screen. Um, okay. If, if Laura, possible. are you able to key that up quickly? Okay, we'll get. We'll give you a second here. All right, can you see that? Yes. Yes, okay, let me just adjust my screen so I can see you. There we go, okay. All right, so the goal of the first phase of work that, that we completed was to identify a viable business model for the Nordegg Discovery Center so that the exhibit development work that happens in phase two considers the center's operational needs and target audiences. And so consideration can be given to all of the community's needs for the spaces that are in that building and, and not just the galleries. And also to do some preliminary interpretation planning and research, identifying storylines and the main interpretive themes and planning for the next phase of work. So phase one was really getting a, getting a lay of the land, developing a strategy, and, um, and doing the initial research that gave us a sense of what kinds of stories and, and themes we could explore in the exhibition in the second phase. Um, next slide. So to do that, we started by talking to the community. So Laura is going to take us through what we did there and tell you about what we heard. I should also note before Laura gets started that our presentation today is pulling from the Nordegg Discovery Center's Exhibit Renewal Project Strategy and Approach document. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you've, you've gotten that um, pre-circulated and, and if not, we can make sure that you get it soon. If you'd like more detail on any of the topics we present today, you, you can start there and there's, there's quite a bit more information than what we'll be able to run through quickly this morning. But Laura, why don't you tell us about the community engagement? Great, thank you. So throughout all the engagement of phase one of the project, which included the community-wide survey, individual interviews, and three small group workshops, there was approximately 174 unique touch points with community members that live, work, and visit Nordagen area. This included former employees of the Discovery Center, individuals that live in the area or are descendants of families that were of the first to live in the area, as well as local business owners, Clearwater County counselors and staff. The questions we asked were connecting 
um, when connecting with various stakeholders circled around stories the community wanted to see in the exhibits, the role the Nordic Discovery Center could play in the community, and the activities and events that the center could host, um, along with all the other things that make Nordic a unique place that people want to learn about. So from these topics, the engagement process resulted in a large batch of data, which was then distilled down through a thematic analysis, and it revealed these six main themes you see on the screen. And these themes would directly inform the business plan and the strategy, along with the content and design of the exhibits. So I'll take you through each of these themes quickly. So the first one is tourist destination and experiences. This theme highlighted the idea that was shared repeatedly during the process that the Discovery Center was well positioned to be a top attraction. And this was because of its location, the increase in tourism to the area, and the surrounding environment that offers multiple experiences. The second theme was history and stories. So this represented the depth of historical roots and exciting stories that were shared with us, uh, particularly stories involving industry, community, and life in a remote town. The third theme, community and culture. This theme represented the fact that Nordeg is a very diverse community with a unique culture that was, there's a strong desire to share that along with the history in the exhibits. And this theme also touched on the ideas that were shared that the Discovery Center could be more than exhibits. It could also be a community space for tourists and local um, people that live in the area. Um, the fourth theme, nature and environment. This theme represented the beauty of the area that was mentioned consistently and the, the need for us to ensure that people, when they visit the center, are understanding how to preserve that area. The fifth theme, education and information. This theme represented the idea that was shared repeatedly that the Discovery Center has an opportunity to be more than historical exhibits and also be a place for things like visitor information and other avenues for learning. And the last theme, business development. This one touched on the ideas that were shared about the partnerships and relationships that the center should prioritize building in the community. So with all these themes combined, came the idea of the Nordic Discovery Center as the hub. And this was a word that was used by multiple different community members in the engagement process. So by analyzing what we heard in the engagement process, um, we began to map out specifically how the Discovery Center could turn those ideas and themes into tangible actions and goals. So then this led to multiple different avenues in which the Discovery Center could become that hub. So this included it could be a multifaceted community hub for experiences, education, and information by being a tourist destination and a base camp for local adventure, by being a center for history, stories, and interactive displays that celebrate what makes Nordic unique, by being a community builder that develops and nurtures its relationships, by being a place for environmental stewardship and appreciation of nature, and by being a space for knowledge sharing and fostering curiosity. So all these components that could make the Nordic Discovery Center a hub culminated into the formation of a strategic framework and business plan. And this is what Crystal is going to talk a little bit more on the next slide. Thanks, Laura. So drawing from that community engagement research that Laura just shared, um, Clearwater County staff participated in a two-part strategy development session to identify values, vision, mission, and impact statements for the Nordeg Discovery Center, and to guide the decision that, that can be used to guide decision-making now in this project to develop the exhibit spaces and into the future. So I, I'm not sure how easy it is for you to see the statements up on the screen, but I'll, I'll just read a couple of the key ones. Um, well, they're all key. <laughs> um, the values that... that um, came out of the data and from and from your your team 
We're a community where we make decisions based on an understanding of the needs of those who live, work, and explore in the area. And this was probably the strongest message that we heard out of community, out of the community engagement. Respect. We are a welcoming and accessible place that embraces diversity of local knowledge. History. We share a, the unique history of the region, encouraging appreciation, exploration, and understanding. And creativity. We spark visitors' imag imaginations and are a cultural hub to activate the community. The vision for the center is that it engages our visitors in the exploration of this place, the stories of its people, communities, and history, and their enduring spirit. And a mission is that the hub is a place for experiences, education, and information. The Nordegg Discovery Center connects visitors and residents with the natural, cultural, and industrial heritage of the region. And then we also developed a series of impact statements that, um, that form the back, backbone for a path to success and around each of the different um, impacts that the, that the center can have in the community. A sense of belonging is strengthened through relationships and opportunities to learn, gather, and share. Environmental stewardship informs decisions and actions. And being a partner in local economic development influences investment, growth, and a thriving Nordegg. And we know that Nordegg is in a very unique place in its history right now, and, and that, that local economic development piece and the partnership piece probably plays a stronger role in, in the development of the Nordegg Discovery Center exhibitions than, than it, it might in a similar um, project in a different place. So um, we hope that you hear the ideas and, and words shared by the community in these statements. And I will go on to the next slide. We also used those same ideas, building on that framework, we, we identified a unique value proposition for the center. So that is a vibrant, connected and collaborative Nordic community, a multifaceted community hub for experiences, education and information. And so you see that experiences, education and information showing up again as, as some of the, the, the key um, purposes and the, and the key unique value proposition behind, behind the business plan for the, for the center. You'll, you'll see what's represented on the slide here on page 16 and 17 of the strategy. It, it, it's a lot. It's a, a business canvas that depicts the value cycle that the Nordegg Discovery Center can develop around so that its unique value proposition offering is ta tailored to the identified visitor segments. You've got a clear path that shows you how you can communicate, market, and build with those segments, build relationships with those segments, and to drive revenue to support the Nordegg Discovery Center's activities. It also shows the inputs into that value cycle from partnerships, resources and assets, activities offered and the cost structure that supports all of, all of the above. So I'm not, I'm not gonna run through everything that's here because I could talk for an hour or two on it, but I did wanna draw your attention to the visitor segments as they prove very important in our decision-making in the exhibit concept that, that you'll see um, Anna present next. So there's four visitor segments that emerged, especially from the community survey and some of, and some of the community engagement around um, in, in that vein. So the, the, four, the four segments are learners and educators. Actually, I should say first, what makes a grouping a visitor segment is that they use the space differently. They're coming for a different reason. And, and so um, meeting the needs of that group, you need to understand what the needs are, and then you target your, your activities and the space offerings and, and what's available to that group's needs, and, and you have a sense of what those are. Um, you know, it, it's meant to combat against the, the, the um, everything for everybody approach, but, but allows you to focus your resources on what the, the visitor segments that are likely to come to your facility genuinely need. So the first grouping is learners and educators. The Nordic Dis Discovery Center offers a high quality learning experience geared to the learner, as well as practically laid out spaces that support the basic needs of field trips and researchers, such as spaces for jackets, lunches, and gathering. And we use spaces throughout the building in order to, in order to make space for that. Adventurers can, find, can expect to find the information they need to plan their adventure. Creature comforts, like a space to shelter from the weather, Wi-Fi access, and, and washrooms 
and a great break for family, friends, or their team or group where they can gain a deeper understanding of the people and places that make the area unique. And it also serves as a, as a rainy day activity for, for that, those, that crew that would like to be out hiking and, and, um, and out on the land, they, you know, it's nice to have, um, it's nice to have places where you can go when the weather doesn't cooperate as well. Hub users are groups, organizations, and businesses who need a space to gather. They are there to meet, hold an event or program, get together or celebrate, or to muster before they head off to another place or activity. And this is part of the way that tourism works in your area. You have a lot of those bus tours, right? So they need spaces for things like like lunches and, and um, places where they, can, where they can get together before they, they go out. Um, these are Nordeg Discovery Center's key local partners and also space renters. And then lastly, there's the people of Nordeg and area, and they probably fit into all of those visitor segments into how, they're, how they would use the space, but they have a deeper relationship with the Nordeg Discovery Center also that centers around their stories. So the people of Nordeg and area hold the history, understand the cultures, and they know what makes Nordeg special. The Nordeg Discovery Center is an opportunity to share that knowledge and experience when they want to, both in the permanent exhibits and through community-led exhibits and programming that can happen in the exhibition spaces and in other places in the building. So those are the, the groupings of, of um, visitors that you're, you're likely to see to the Nordeg Discovery Center, and, um, and we considered those very strongly in the design concept that is coming next. And I think we have one more slide. We just wanted to talk as we're moving into phase two, um, what you can expect for May long weekend 2023. So the opening of the Discovery Center building will, will happen in advance of the long weekend. And, and what you'll see is that the building will be open um, you, and you can talk more to your, your staff will have details on this, but um, you know, so washroom access, targeting that, that adventure stream, making sure that they have access to information center um, type um, information and uh, visitor information center information. And that'll be available in the, in the hallway in the main corridor of the building. And that also creates a spot where the tickets can be sold for the for the mine tours and, and that sort of thing. So so the landing pad of the main hallway will be open. Um, there will be exhibition um, spaces in, in that along that wall, as well as a, a television that you can use to communicate key messages and um, and some sneak peeks into what's coming on the on the inside in the galleries where there's where it takes a little bit longer to develop those spaces and they're anticipated for May 2024, probably actually in advance of May, but likely you're gonna wanna do a, a May opening just the way that the, the tourism and um, spring season works. So opening of the Nordic Discovery Center with renewed exhibits and galleries can be anticipated then. Um, and um, there'll be sneak peeks running on the, in, in posters on the doors and, and probably up on the, on the screens as well. We've also been working with Nordic, um, with Clearwater County staff about how we, can, how we can look at using some of your communication channels, social media, et cetera, to build a little bit of buzz and, and engage the community in some of the, some of the activities that, we, that we'd um, like, where we'd like them to help with the exhibitions. And, um, and so that they can start getting excited about the space and learning about what, what will be inside. And I'm sure that's what you're most excited to see. So I, I'll um, pass it off now to Anna and she can run through the concept. Okay. Thank you very much, Crystal. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. We're quite excited about taking this space from a blank canvas to uh, something that really will become a hub for the community. So what we're going to do today is walk you through this space and tell you a little bit about the inspiration behind our designs and how um, people might use the space and feel comfortable in it. So if I can get the next slide, Laura. Perfect, thank you. So here is the entrance way. This is um, where we're gonna immediately welcome people to the space and sort of anchor them uh, to our color scheme and immediately get them uh, moving into this space. So you can see that we've got a beautiful shade of green and a beautiful shade of blue. So we're taking some inspiration from nature, but maybe being a little bit more bold with our color choice. And then people go up the stairs 
and then Laura will have them walk through. And then this is just the main um, foyer area that we're all familiar with. Um, we have a beautiful desk set up uh, so that we have people manning the desk where they can be welcomed and they can start to receive some visitor information. So as I walk through, just a reminder to everyone that uh, any photos you see or any um, text you see, those are all just kind of placeholders for us to think about the space. And they're just to provide us inspiration. They're, they may or may not be the actual text or the actual photos or information that we're using. So just take a little um, uh, leeway in, in thinking about what might go there. But we do want to invite people to um, have places to see immediately when they walk in. They can immediately be connected with the beauty of the Nordic area. And so we want to highlight a few sites right when they walk in that they might be able to go and explore close by and then maybe further afield as well. We've also set up this space so that you can see there's a distinct um, entry point and an exit point. There is a, a real flow to the exhibit space. So we want to make sure people are um, going into the space and coming out of the space in, in a storyline and in a pattern that makes sense. So we invite people then to move down to the other side of the desk where they'll invite, um, we invite them to explore the exhibit. At near this entry space, we also have um, encouraging people to be safe when they're exploring the Nordic area because we know that maybe cell phone service isn't great in some places or maybe they've never done some backcountry adventures before, or maybe you know they've never been to the area before. So we wanna invite them to explore the area in a safe way. So this is where we will have maybe a map or two. We will have our bear country uh, safety tips. We want them to connect with the, Sk the Sasquatch um, uh, campaign and the idea of leaving no trace. We really want them to understand how you explore an area like Nordic and do it in a safe way. And then we're also trying to encourage uh, stewardship of the land. I think that's really important too. And that's kind of a key message that'll come throughout uh, the exhibit space as well. Now, I don't know if um, any of you have been to the uh, center lately, but there is um, a, a fake mine entry way right in the main foyer area. So what we've done is we've designed the exhibit space to kind of capture that sense of we're stepping back into history, we're going to step into a coal mine and step back into this idea of connecting to Nordegg's industrial heritage. So Laura, we'll go to the next slide. There we go. Yeah, now we can see the entrance a little bit. So we have found some really great historic photos um, through the Provincial Archives, through the Glenbow, uh, through various different sources. And so one of my favorites happens to be this one of the old coal mine entrance. And we've got a coal miner and it's sort of inviting us into that space and uh, taking us back well over 100 years. So I think it's a really great choice is we're connecting uh, ourselves immediately to the coal uh, industry in the Nordic area. And on the right hand side, we're going to see what the, the, the exhibit fabricators can do for us is we'd love to kind of have like a coal touch wall and um, we're, we're just going to have to see where we can go artistically with that, but I think it could be kind of interesting where um, it, it definitely feels like we're stepping back into a coal mine. And then we'll have a photo of uh, Martin Nordegg to uh, inform people very quickly into the exhibit process about who uh, helped found the town and where the Nordegg name came from and things like that. So thanks, Laura, for the next slide. So here, this is, we're going to just call this gallery one for now. We want uh, to invite people to explore the Nordic area, and we want them to connect and contemplate with nature. You know, what makes Nordic such a special place? Well, it's got a really interesting industrial heritage, and it's got some amazing um, uh, landscapes and uh, opportunities to connect with nature. So that's what we'll invite people to do uh, in the first gallery space. 
So we've walked through the coal mine now. And so this is on our left-hand side. This is where we'll have a fabulous historic photo. It will have some interesting um, smaller photos to uh, connect people to this heritage. And, you know, I really like to have some photos with some people in them. So you can sort of, sort of see the grit associated with that heritage. And then we'll have some uh, tools and artifacts up top uh, where people can kind of see what, uh, what implements would have been used at that time. And then, Laura, if we go to the next slide, then we'll look ahead. And you can see on the left-hand side, we'll, um, you have a number of the storage lockers from the Brazo collieries, and we thought they would make a fantastic display for um, implements and artifacts and objects that we can show people, you know, this was really uh, hard work, you know, hand tools, connect them with that idea of, uh, you know, just moving inch by inch through the space in underneath the, the, uh, the ground. And then we'll have a beautiful photo of the Brazo Colliery. So what we're trying to do is invite them to go visit the site. And then we're also trying to allow them just a hint of uh, what the uh, experience might be of going up there and what it was like to work in the mines. And then, oh, one of our favorite things is the horse helmet. We've got a great photo of a horse wearing a horse helmet, and then we actually have a horse helmet from uh, your area. So we're gonna incorporate that into the space. And then on the right, this is going to be more of the um, natural history of the area. We're going to uh, inform people about the indigenous connection to the land and that this is sacred territory. And then we will uh, let people know about the wild horses because, you know, many of them, uh, the people coming to the area may see the wild horses. And that is quite uh, exciting and interesting, I think, for many people. So we will get them uh, informed about what those, where those wild horses may have come from. And then to the right of that, we will have uh, a little display on the importance of the watershed in the area and the topography and geography and how that uh, serves the area. And, you know, and at the same time, we're using these photos to let people know of the sites that are around Nordic that they can visit as well. And then you can see below there's drawers. Those will be little discovery drawers um, that people can open. And it will also serve as a bench because seating is very important uh, in museums as well. So if somebody needs a break already, they can just have a little seat. And then we've got a couple of um, uh, display cases. They're round at the moment to sort of echo like a tree trunk. We'll see what the fabricators can do for us. And then we'll put a few artifacts uh, and objects in those display cases. And then you can see in this area too, we've used like a green color palette, again, reflecting nature. Okay, let's go to the next one. And this is that, um, uh, indigenous sacred places wall. This is the other side where the um, display drawers are as well. We want to invite the community to participate in creating some artwork for this space and we want them to uh, maybe do some little paintings about the plants and insects of the Nordic area. So this allows uh, people to start to identify some of this while they're out in nature. But uh, this is also the opportunity for the community to contribute to the space. So I think it could end up being quite beautiful as well. Okay, Laura. And then if we start to shift now down into sort of the main area of the room, um, we're very mindful of this idea of Instagramming and photos and selfies and all of that. So we have a few places where we're presenting information, but we can also make some really excellent um, photograph, um, photographic opportunities. So we've got quite a nice big wall where we can uh, put, we've got black bear, grizzly bear and moose right now, uh, cutouts that are gonna be actual size or pretty close to actual size. So people can get a sense of how big some of these animals in this area are and help them learn to identify tracks and things that, that you know, scat and things that they might see that um, will inform them that, gosh, black bears are in the area. So it's it's twofold there. It's a uh, Instagram opportunity and it's uh, an information opportunity as well. And then to the left, we have a children's area. We've got 
a trapper's tent where we'll have some activity drawers, some information, some bookshelves. Um, maybe you can see, we might have a better photo on the left-hand side where there's some little um, cutouts in the wall where we can stick our hands in and, you know, maybe we'll have some furs and things like that, that people can um, touch and, and engage with that way. So, oh yeah, that's good like that. Okay, next slide, please. And then the next room, we'll just call it gallery two. This is sort of our opportunity to meet the community and connect with community and meet the trailblazers. So we want um, people to know about people that live in the area and how they've helped shape the community. So let's go to the next slide. And one of the things that's really fabulous about this space is there's all those big beautiful windows that let in a lot of beautiful light. And so we have to be mindful of the fact we have to balance letting in the light versus um, protecting and conserving any artifacts in the space. So we are going to do a window treatment that is reflecting nature on the outside, but also informing people about the kinds of tree species they might see. So they can learn and, you know, what's the difference between a spruce tree, a fir tree, an aspen? Uh, because many of us simply don't know that because we're maybe not seeing those in our everyday life. So this is an opportunity to have people learn about tree species that are in the area. And it, we also are mindful that this will be seen from the outside. So it's um, sort of a gentle uh, vista, I guess you'd say from the outside as well. It's not, you know, crazy colors or people or anything like that. It's reflecting nature once again. And then below that, that's, you can sort of see like a bench area, that's um, where we'll put the information about this, the tree species. Okay, Laura. And then, so in front of that, in this second gallery space, this is the opportunity where we can highlight some of the artifacts associated with the community. And one of the things we always like to um, display in small towns is there's usually a pretty strong sports uh, community. And uh, it's always quite important to history and creating that sense of community. So we've got some interesting artifacts that we have found that we can highlight. And then we also have discovery drawers below that as well. So people can um, further explore some of those stories. And I know people were quite excited about the bobsled. So we've got the bobsled up at the top so everybody can see that. That was something that everybody brought up that we talked to. So it's there and we'll tell some stories about it. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is sort of our feature wall, the back wall. And this is a timeline. And once again, these are photos and dates that we've just sort of pulled in our research. It's not necessarily the absolute um, final selection. Um, you can see again, we've used really bold colors. We've got that rich blue. We've kind of got a deep sunset pinky red. And then um, that contrasts with the uh, really excellent choice of black and white photos we have from um, the archives that we've been searching. Uh, one of the things I wanna connect people to is, I'm not sure if you can see the quote on the top of the wall. It's an interpretive theme statement. And that is something we use to guide our storylines and our presentation. And in many ways, it's a purpose statement and it's guided how we present this space to visitors. And I'm gonna just read it out. It's, the statement is, among clear waters and rugged mountains live stories of perseverance, resilience and creating community. So that is something we just wanna have echo in everything that we do. This idea of you know, persevering with the development of the mine, the resilience of the community after the mine closed and how over well over a hundred years uh, community has been created by the people that have lived there. And that is reflected in the timeline as well. And then to make the timeline a little bit more 3D, we've got kind of a photo album, I guess, on the wall as well that we can uh, highlight a few more people and places uh, on that in that space. Okay, let's go to the next wall. And this is now the wall um, as we exit. This is our community spotlight space. So this might be, 
I'm going to call it a temporary exhibit space. This is we can change things out here a little bit more easily than in other spaces. So we'll have display cases. You could be showcasing local events or local artists. Um, uh, you know, it says on the wall here, like the Christmas market, you know, things like that. So this is we can think of it as the community showcase and allow uh, more changes uh, to the exhibit space than might be happening in the other areas. And now we've got, you can see um, some color photographs, again, trying to inform people about activities they can do in the area. And then we'll go to the next one. And this is sort of stepping back a little bit. So you can see that it's that sports showcase and then uh, the community wall. And then on the right, we have our music um, area. We have found, in addition to sports, music also plays an important role in a lot of small communities. And I think Nordeg is no exception. Uh, one of the things we discovered in our research is that uh, Bruce Hack, the father of techno music, is from was born in the Nordeg area. So we have found some interesting things about him that we will highlight in that area and give people an opportunity to listen to his very interesting music. And uh, another person to highlight uh, was Guido D'Amico, the Italian cowboy, I think he was known as, and we will put a listening station for him as well. And then any other um, people that we feel should be highlighted can certainly go in that area and in many ways it's also a quiet space if we want people to just sit and have a rest that's a good place to do it as well we're mindful of um, providing seating in the area so they can just sit and read a book about Bruce Hack or they can sit and listen as well that's up to them and you can see the color choices there are a little bit more groovy because um, Guido and Bruce were more working in like 60s 70s early 80s so we're a bit more bold and we've got some you know flying saucer lights and having a bit of fun in that corner as well and then we exit the space and I think we'll just keep walking forward I think then we're done in the space yes okay thank you very much And so, so that's our presentation for you today. And we've got some time for questions if anybody wants to, if anyone wants to know more. Super, that looks very, it looks look very good presentation. Thank you for that. And we have a number of questions. So I'll start with uh, uh, Deputy Reeve Milhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Uh, this is very exciting. I'm really much, very much looking forward to seeing it uh, come together. I do have a few questions though. Um, with regards to the hub, um, uh, community in the southern portion of our of our county in Caroline already has their their building is called the hub. Um, mm -hmm. Are we able to maybe brainstorm some other ideas? Maybe like the axis or I, like just something. <laughs> we can even look up synonyms or something to do of yeah. hub. Just we already have a, a building within within Clearwater County or with, within the greater Clearwater County area that is called the hub. Um, and are, are we using any local fabrication um, artists like we were told that the reason this has been so delayed is because many of the fabrication stuff is coming from many other places we have wonderful artists wonderful fabrication people mm -hmm. is there an opportunity to utilize some of the amazing talent we have within Clearwater County and then perhaps not have to wait for equipment to be shipped from perhaps other countries um, are we at all showcasing the fact that this was a also a prison after if it was a mine um, and have we actually consulted with the First Nations um, when this was all being built like are they part of this installation process I know there's a lot of questions that I'm throwing at you but those are the first ones on the top of my head okay all right so I'll work through them and if I miss any come back to me or, or redirect me um, so on the hub, that's that's a, a word that that came up repeatedly from from people in in your community, and so that's so that's how it uh, how it landed in the documents. It is a it is a concept about about the idea of how the building can function. You don't have to put it over the door. You could definitely we could definitely find another another word that ca that encapsulates the same idea, um, but using the idea of you know hub and spoke that come together and then go out. 
um, that's that's sort of how we how we develop the business plan. But there's lots of different you know representations of that that we that you could you could use so that you're not stepping on anyone's toes. That that would be perfectly reasonable. Um, the second question was around local local fabricators. I think. Yeah. Um, Okay, so so the timeline is is not not exactly around um, around fabrication. It's it's more it, it was was more around availability of of um, of staffing and being able to to in, engage with Clearwater County staff to as as a conduit to be able to talk to the community and do that planning piece and 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 it, it was a, it was a bit of a slow slog getting through the, the planning stage. That's that's for sure. Um, and now that we've moved into phase phase two, what we were looking for is is a one stop shop and an, an exhibit um, a fabrication company. We've actually uh, Clearwater County has actually awarded the the contract after an RFP process to a company called Great Northern Scenes. Um, they're out of Vancouver. They work in in Western Canada and all over the world um, in rural and remote communities. Um, and and the materials that that company will use to to create the the um, the things in the exhibit that that you saw are sometimes quite quite specialty. Those can can come locally, and when we have opportunity to use local providers, we definitely will. The other thing that um, we we <laughs> again we could talk for hours about the concept, so we didn't necessarily dive into some of the some of the deeper things in there. There's a few opportunities for art pieces to be incorporated for sure. The the ones that um, that uh, local community members can make around the, the bugs and the leaves and the plants and that sort of thing. We also hope to engage with an, an Indigenous artist on, on the, that sacred spaces wall. There's, there's other places where we could incorporate art as well. So we're very conscious of that. And, and we're, we're excited for, for the reorganization that happened with this project. And we were, we were partnered with the um, Agriculture and Community Department. And, and we think that that's going to be a really nice um, Place to be situated for for better access to the to the community, so that so that we can um, get a sense of what's out there and how to incorporate um, those those incredible resources into the exhibition. So definitely, um, on on indigenous engagement, we invited um, indigenous folks to be part of some of the um, early community engagement. Um, we didn't always have a lot of uptake there, but that's not for any particular reason other than than scheduling and 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 you know things sometimes being difficult. But we have met with um, with the elder and community liaison from from Bighorn, and um, we've been invited to meet again with them. We we are very conscious of the fact that you cannot force indigenous engagement you cannot force in um, indigenous stories into an exhibition like this and we work with indigenous communities in the museum world have for for a long time and and we know that it's about relationships so so we've we've started to provide opportunities and have conversations and some of those community spaces that that anna showed um, and some of the flex spaces within the within the design are specifically meant so that those stories can come online when you're ready and when those relationships which need to be with Clearwater County and Clearwater County staff and, and local Indigenous communities, we can we can help and be facilitators, but they really need to be owned by you. That, that as those relationships grow and stories are ready to be shared, that there's space to do that in. So, so Indigenous um, history and voices will not be absent from the exhibit but they they will be there in a way that they can grow so so they may they may start smaller than where we hope that you end and and i think i missed one is there is there anything else i didn't speak um, to I, I think there was uh, some mention of the historical prison that was there too right. and that's yeah it has an opportunity to be included somewhere in there yes I think. Yeah, so that that there's there's a bunch of places where we've got opportunity to to share because there's so many stories, right? So so the drawers, the timeline wall, that sort of thing. I saw Anna nodding that it's on her radar. Do do you have anything specific you can share, Anna, or is this something that'll develop with the research? Um, it can develop with the research, but I think we envisioned it maybe in the timeline wall area. And um, I found some really interesting documents from the '70s that uh, reflect the prison history. And uh, we're certainly looking for photos from that era. So if the county is aware of photos that represent uh, the prison history, I would certainly 
love to receive them because that's been something that's been a challenge to find. And a question from Councillor Graham. Thank you, Pete. I would certainly echo De Deputy Reeve Melhoff's everything she said, but especially on having local contractors and artists, it's really disappointing to me that someone out of BC has been hired when we have so many talented people locally here. Even the coal wall that you guys mentioned you wanted to do in the entrance way, we have many artists that are capable of doing a wonderful project there, I'm sure, along with other ones. And the only other thing that I thought of as well was to have Maybe you mentioned it and I missed it, but a history on the town and why it's built the way it is. From my understanding, it's based on your places in Europe, and that's why it's kind of rounded streets and stuff. So it would be cool to include that in an exhibit as well. Thank you. I, I think um, there's there's a graphic on the timeline wall that reflects that that um, the way that the town was laid out by Martin Nordig, and um, and so so that'll definitely be in there. There's a couple spots we can talk about that, and. Um, Exhibit development and, and the, the components that are in exhibitions, they, they, they're, they're, they're quite specialized so that they can so that they can protect the artifacts so that they can stand up to um, so that they can stand up to high traffic and that sort of thing. That doesn't mean that we won't incorporate um, working with with local folks and that and local materials and that and, and that sort of thing. But um, for the for the sake of your budget and your timeline, it, it, it does tend to be faster to to work with a with a firm that that's able to wrap that um, wrap that whole project in. And Councillor Swanson, please. Yes, it's an exciting project that uh, you you brought to us. I'm wondering in regards to we talked about or there's going to be a soft opening or you know in the main hallway uh, here in you know very shortly. I know you guys are probably inundated with a cabillion photos. So is there a way to put up a slide that you're not going, or sorry, some kind of electronic board that you can show the photos that you may not necessarily use in the display, but they're still acknowledging the story of that. So when people come in, they get some sense of what's going on. Uh, that's just my suggestion. And then when you look at the animal cutouts, to me, you forgot the most important animal, and that's the big horn. We, we, yeah, maybe Anin can speak to, to the animal cutouts. There's, there were lots of animals we wanted to include, and we, and we do think that if the budget holds for it, we'd love to put them in other places as well so that we, we get the, the sheep and some of the others. Um, no. And um, the first question was about oh, photos. photos. So, so, so the TV that'll be right up a, a, over the desk provides opportunity for just that. So it, you can use it for key messages. There's an event in town. Um, here's how much it costs to go see the mine, you know, really practical kind of stuff, but it can also rotate with, with whatever you need. Um, tourism messages, um, his, history and stories and photos. It, it provides a, a, a lot of options that way. And maybe I'll just add to that, that we will be looking to do some of those things, even time, of course, the museum into the mine site as tours fire back up this spring as crystal pointed out sort of that tv will be that bridge opportunity until we have the full exhibits opened and then um you know move forward to not just administering this plan within those two rooms but they took you through the process of how we're going to increase access and increase functionality within the entire building as a whole so um, priority, you know, of course, is for the two uh, exhibit rooms and, and, and we're speaking a lot about, you know, what's going to go on there. But, um, you know, don't forget about the stuff that was said early on in the presentation about the rest of the building and, and where we'll be able to fill in some of these gaps. Um, and, of course, we're all super excited, you know, with, with not a lot going on in the last few years. But we are uh, having to even temper our own desires uh, for this year because there's just so much we're going to be able to do and and with you know doing too much might take away from the priorities that we have so that sort of the folks at Hatley are, are here to make sure we do it right not just fast thank you 
and uh, uh, question. I saw Anna's hand go up. Oh, oh can, I, can oh, sure. I just add, I think, you know, we're doing these two gallery spaces in the foyer area, but definitely think of your whole building as an interpretive space. You know, we can put the cutouts in the bathroom, in the hallway upstairs, on the stairwell. Um, one thing we heard from former employees was that people loved looking at photographs, you know, of the history, uh, the history of the area. And so, yes, we're very mindful of that, even just making like a little photo album to have beside a chair of, you know, copies of historic photos. So there's layers to interpretation, there's layers to the storytelling. And so what we're doing right now is creating that groundwork for you so that you can build in the, the months and years to come and uh, think about how you can use that whole building as an interpretive space. And uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, one of the other things that I had noticed is that it says the Ram Watershed. Um, we have obviously the North Saskatchewan Watershed and the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance has already done a large portion of the historical work and historical photographs and the um, Indigenous relationship with the water. So um, that perhaps there's an opportunity for you to reach out to the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance and uh, they can help you help you with that. Uh, one of my other comments was um, in a previous presentation, either last year or the year before, um, when this was in planning, we were told a lot of the artifacts were put on loan somewhere. So I don't remember where they were sent, um, but uh, I was told that they were originally, they were sent to Calgary for um, an exhibit there and that we'd be getting them back when we were ready for them. So perhaps there's a lot of, um, was, I believe her name was Anna. Um, you were looking for some photos and artifacts. Um, perhaps we should reach out to wherever they were sent and get them back. Okay, to, to, we're not aware of a loan, but that, that could very well be. Um, many of the, one of the, many of the artifacts are, are currently being stored in another building in Nordegg and, um, and Clearwater County staff have been working. Um, they've just connect, been connected with a collections um, specialist and, and they're working to relocate um, the, the items back into the, the building. They've, they've been, um, They've been moved around a few times, and whenever you do that with museum co collections, you tend to lose a little bit of the provenance and a little bit of the, the connectivity of the, the items to the stories. Um, so, so that's been that's been a struggle for us, but it's it's not one that we're we're not able to work around, and and we're excited for the work that the the county is doing to to provide a little more access to those those artifacts, so that we can incorporate as many as possible into the interpretive center space. Also, also, this is just. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, no. Just a museum world trick. Um, museums never have. Uh, we're, we're designing an interpretive space, interpretive center space, which is by its its nature light on artifacts and and higher on information and stories, which which came from your community and your staff and the research is that that was the right match for Nordeg and and I think it absolutely is. Um, but all all museums, no matter what you call them, interpretive centers to you know the Glembo. Um, there's always a lot of the collection that isn't on display and you've got that in storage and you've got that in other places. And that gives you opportunity to, to share new stories over time because it'll be, it'll be great to have a big splash when, when we have the grand opening of this space, but this, this facility needs to serve your community in the long term, And it gives you a chance to tell new stories as you go and rotate things out of those drawers and those cases and, and those community spaces so that you can keep it fresh. And Councillor Graham, please. I just kind of had a thought as we were chatting here, Nichols, well, once again, with Deputy Bell Health's comments. Back in my ag days, I was part of taking down the, the old prison, and there was a prison cell in the basement of it still. And it may be an impossible task, but it would be cool if staff could hunt down whoever ended up with that prison cell, and it could be maybe featured in there. Mr. Martinson. Yeah, as Crystal alluded to, we are working through our... Um, collection um, and working with consultants and, and we have you new know, training uh, plan this spring to, to work through that this summer and, and this fall. Um, specifically about the jail cell, we do have a, 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 at least one um, of those uh, amongst other large and heavy uh, things that have come <laughs> out of uh, 
building. So that's part of what, what we're doing um, this spring so that Hatley can have access to what we have. It's hard to plan for something you don't know you have or, or what have or what the quality is, uh, what the connection is. We can't just throw something in there without a story to tell. We can't just make up the story. So all those things um, are what we're working through now and that information will be provided to Hatley and they'll use that to design the best space that we can. This isn't gonna be static and concrete for the next 50 years. Um, we'll have an opportunity to, you know, um, make things um, um, new and fresh building off the foundation that we have so um, part of being able to do that is understanding what's in that collection and Councillor Swanson this just brought you you've alluded alluded to it and that is you know the artifacts that may not be in the local area anymore because the people people that used to be there have taken them back home. So anybody who's listening that, and I, through the request of, you know, you know, we need photos, we would, you know, love more photos of that era, things like that. What's the best way for the, maybe people that are still living there or people are outside the area that would like to contribute to this or get in touch with? Is it through the county or through your group specifically uh, if they would like to offer some, some photos or some artifacts that they may feel because the more this gets out, that, you know, and people come back to visit, they, you know, they may say, oh, I, I remember that. Granddad had this or that kind of thing. So could you give us a, an opportunity for people to contact you or contact the county? What's the best way? We want people to contact us. Um, we've already seen that start um, now that there's a little bit more um, um, chatter about the, the museum and the mine site being open this spring, we are getting people to contact us. So um, we certainly can be reached, you know, through the county's office. We have a heritage at Clearwater County website. Um, and we're certainly uh, open to, to talk with whoever. Um, they may not have a picture, but they might have a story. Um, we're certainly willing to hear them as well. But pictures are always um, great. Maps, we, we received a map this spring. Um, from an uh, interested party um, that, that uh, given us opportunity to scan in uh, an old map. Um, so all, all those things are, are very well uh, appreciated and, and we encourage people to reach out to us um, at the county. And we'll provide all that information to, to Hatley as we get it organized and they'll use that as their resources to continue on as they've uh, outlined. Thank you, Mr. Martinson. I think it's very important that we uh, inspire our community. Much of this is an oral history, and uh, I've heard many, many stories about Nordig that probably have never been captured, um, you know, in the written form or, or any way to really archive it. So hopefully we can inspire some of those stories to come out so they can be archived and continued on for further generations. Uh, additional questions? I'll turn it over to Crystal if she's got any... Uh, Final comments here, and uh, I don't. I don't think so. I think. Um, I think what what we're doing with you now. What we, what we did at first was was building a strategy and a and a business plan and some of the initial research to develop the themes and and that sort of that sort of work. What we're doing with you now is is helping to build the, build those exhibition spaces. So there's an envelope for for your heritage activities to continue over time. And then what you'll need to do next is build a bit of, a, a bit of an organization around, around what does it mean to, to have the Nordic Discovery Center and, and what, do, what do you need to manage that collection, to have engaging programs, to, to have um, opportunities for people to, to come in. And, and, um, and of course, you've, you've, got <laughs> you've got excellent staff and, and, um, and a great team and, and it might just, uh, but, but you haven't done it this way before and and it, it might take a little bit of um a little bit of rethinking about the potential of that space because it really is a very unique building and a very unique place where there isn't a lot of other um services or, or community gathering spaces and so so the opportunities for nordeg and area and and all those people that come through that corridor are are really huge and and so we hope that what we're creating here is a is a launch pad for that that can continue can continue to grow and, and develop and, and serve the needs of your community in, in years to come. So 
We thank you very much for allowing us to present this morning and, and um, you, you know how to find us through, through Matt and Anna Marie. And if you have any further questions or, or would like any further information, we're happy to answer them. Well, thank you very much, uh, Crystal and team for joining us this morning for the project update. It was very interesting. And uh, I, I, look forward to, uh, I look forward to seeing the end results here very, very soon. Um, I'd look to Council for a motion to uh, receive the Nordig Discovery Center Exhibition Renewal Project update for information as presented. Uh, Councillor Cermak was the first hand I saw. All those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for joining us this morning. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, with that, I think we'll take a 10-minute uh, break here before we move on with the rest of the agenda for today.
Well, welcome back, everyone. We continue through our agenda of the uh, next couple of days here, but uh, we'll start with um, item 5.1, and that is a capital project um, group of documents, a summary. And I'll turn the floor across to Ms. Sirhan to uh, introduce this item. Good morning, Council or Strategic, Strategic Planning Committee. Over the next couple days, we're going to have um, lots of information in front of you. Um, I'm going to be going back and forth on a couple of the items because they're so interlinked. It's hard to just say, okay, we're going to look at this um, without looking at this piece of the pie until later and whatever. So um, all the documents are there and we will be going through them all, but just know that um, uh, I might be moving back and forth a little bit. Um, one of the reasons we're doing this um, in-depth um, look at the capital projects is the 10-year plan has really, um, although it's been in front of council, um, none of the decisions really for that long-range forecasting have been made by this sitting council. So we want to make sure, um, especially in the next five-year look, that you've seen all the projects that are in that five-year look and that they are a priority for this council and they're in the year that you want um, to see that capital project go forward and what sort of funding source you see um, for those projects. Um, each of the departments will be going through uh, each project that is on their five-year capital list um, individually so it's going to be a lot a lot of information um, we have printed these documents as if we were um, planning the 2024 budget because we're planning the 2024 budget and even though this is looking out um, 10 years it is the 2024 budget and what we see into the future for 10 years in 2024 so even though these are these numbers span 10 years, it is still considered the 2024 budget, budget package. Um, when we get to the 2024 budget deliberations, all you will be asked to um, approve is the 2024 projects. That being said, there might be the odd one in 2025 that has um, been tendered in 2024 or 2023 that are considered approved because um, the tender documents have been out and the project is awarded. Um, so there is a, a little bit of an anomaly there for future years, but for the most part, what you're being asked to approve in budget deliberations will be just that 2024 um, year. Going through the 10 years is a good process just to make sure that the projects that are on the list, we are planning for a funding source. We are planning for resources to make that um, project happen. And um, again, the, the province requires a five-year capital plan. Uh, Clearwater County does do a 10-year plan. And those last five years are really a, a real estimate as to what those costs will be for those projects because as you are aware, costing changes um, quite significantly year from year sometimes. Um, and the other thing is that we wanna make sure that uh, if there is a project that you're um, interested in moving forward that it is kind of in the vicinity of the year that you feel that it would be uh, moving forward and that is the strategic planning committee as a whole and by the end of the two days we hope that the strategic planning committee uh, as a whole will be making recommendations to council um, for um, 2024's budget and funding sources for these um, projects that you will see again likely in the September area uh, of time for uh, 2023 looking at 2024's budget and then of course in bu budget deliberations in December of 2023. Um, so uh, you can see by the capital project summary um, document 
is summarized um, by funding source in the first part of that uh, report. So starting on page three of that capital project summary document, the first two pages are the agenda item. And then, um, so you'll see combination, which is something that we're working on with the software company. Um, if it's being funded by more than one uh, area, so say a really good example of that is um, the uh, partnership between um, the town and the county for the fire equipment. Um, part of that is being funded through restricted surplus, Clearwater County's portion, and the other portion is being funded through a transfer from another municipality. And currently, they don't really have a way to identify that on the on the in the spot that this report pulls from. So I was I have been in discussions with them, hoping to get that sorted out so that it won't be a, a little bit vague as far as what where that um, funding is going to come from. Then you'll see next is grants, which um, there's federal gas tax fund um, identified in 2024 and then none moving forward. I think there's some uh, room to um, put that into some projects. It's about 650,000 a year. Um, and I think they identify it to 2025. But it is the one grant that comes from the federal government, not the provincial government, and has been pretty steady at 600, between 600,000, and I think even one year it was 670,000 in the last 15 years. So it's, it's pretty static. The MSI Capital um, grant, uh, I think we need to have a look at. I think there's more identified there than, than what um, is uh, available. That being said, I think this is one of the other ones that might be funded in two different spots. So when we look at the detail, it'll say which jobs and how much they are, and we'll just make sure that that's where we want those jobs, those projects funded. And then, and you know, <laughs> when I first started, there was many different grant uh, opportunities to fund capital projects. And really, these are the last two. MSI Capital is um, the really only major uh, capital grant that's available from the province. And the Federal Gas Tax Fund is the only one that's really available um, from the federal government that, that we can count on year over year. There's other ones that we are project specific that um, staff and, and staff directed um, contractors have been applying for and of course been successful in um, gaining some of those grants over the past four or five years. One, a good example of that is the STIP funding for bridges. It's really not um, readily available. They don't, some years they fund it, some years they don't, but um, we've had really good success in, in getting some of that grant funding um, most years. We've had the odd year where we haven't gotten any. So then you can see the restricted, different restricted surpluses that are being drawn from um, in each of the years. Um, what I challenged uh, staff with was to find a restricted surplus fund that kind of matched the project they were doing so that we could get a total for what we should be saving for year over year in the different instances one of the things you'll see is the core infrastructure fund. There, there was an initial $3 million put in there and it hasn't been funded since. And you can see that, um, you know, the, uh, identifying core infrastructure projects that could be funded through that, there, there is major spending out of that restricted surplus uh, account uh, for the next several years. and. So there needs to be a calculation on what would need to go into that restricted surplus account to fund those, um, because it can't go into a negative, uh, with the exception of the Nordic due to do from. We'll talk about how the, these these restricted surpluses are funded in a minute, but um, and you can see that um, you know there's there's quite a bit more being funded through restricted surplus than there ever has been in the past. Um, not to say that that money is currently earmarked to go in there. So 
uh, you know, there's a lot of work to do over the next two days and um, we look forward to hearing the Strategic Planning com Committee's thoughts on um, which projects are a priority and um, spelling out the funding um, options for each of those projects. So again, in, in that summary document, there's um, the expenditure side, which should match the revenue or, or the funding side, which it currently doesn't. But that's not a huge deal. We're not approving anything today and we're not, um, you know, this is a, a discovery uh, session where we're trying to get the information we need to make sure that these documents are um, where you expect to see them when you go to approve budget in, in December. So the first of a couple sessions going through this information, I'm sure. This one will be by far be the most detailed, though. A question from Deputy Reeve Milhoff. Yes. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, during budget, we were given like a color-coded surplus yeah. graph. Um, and I believe, and maybe I'm looking at wrong, reading it wrong, or I'm on the wrong page. Um, there's several of parts in that graph that are missing on here, like the building yep. fund, the, yep. the tax stabilization fund, the... Anyway, yeah, so the, several others that are not yes, listed. Exactly. If if there's not funds being pulled from them in the next ten years and they don't show up on here. This is just the projects that are identified in the ten year capital plan. And one of the ones that you're seeing uh, that you're commenting about is the um, um, building is in that combination um oh, okay. uh heading because it's being funded through um, the restricted surplus for the facilities, but then it's also being funded through the sale of other buildings. And then, you know, there's some, I think we've identified that the balance would come through restricted surplus, but two different funding sources for that project. And as you get into the detail, uh, starting on page, um, Sorry. Is there an opportunity to be resent a current, one of the color coded ones we said? Because just because it's not being shown that it's being pulled out of here doesn't mean it's not available to be pulled out of. Exactly. And we can adjust. Exactly. Yeah. With this council's. Yes, I will thoughts. be. I can print that for you. That'd be great. And, Thank you. Uh, send it around. You can see on starting on page seven is the combination projects. And you'll see the first one there, which uh, when we get into um, community services and uh, agriculture, um, is the uh, AgRec facility that's identified as $12 million coming out of um, restricted surplus in 2028 and um, 10 million coming out in 2030. So again, that's a project that we'll have to discuss. And um, once we get, um, Strategic Planning Committee's uh, recommendation as far as priority for that project and what they, then we'll make changes to that and of course update that um, restricted surplus um, spreadsheet accordingly. Um, but I will send that around uh, as it stands right now. A, a question I would have as as we look into the future 10 years, we have to make some estimations and projections. Um, yeah. Are these values in here anticipating a certain um, uh, increase in costs as we move forward, or are they looking at the dollars we deal with on the day-to-day -day right now in 2023? I think for the most part, and the, and the team can correct me, but... Um, they tried to estimate what they thought it would be in that year. Um, you know, the farther out it goes, though, <laughs> the yes. harder it is to guess that number. So, okay, no, just uh, just wanted to kind of understand from the beginning if we are uh, having to add mentally into the future that these could cost a lot more than what's shown there. Or yeah, not. So. for sure. Okay, so um, this is where I'm going to jump around a little bit. I'm going to go to that 5.3 if it's uh, all right with the committee. Yes, please. And um, we will go through the PowerPoint for uh, the restricted surplus. Before I do that, I just printed off 
um, a couple of pages out of the financial statements for 2021. Just, I just want to show you where these numbers are coming from and try to um, have you correlate what you're seeing here and how that information, um, you use that information to, to plan for those capital projects and how it affects your financial state. Oh, Tracy's going to send them around. Thanks. <clears throat> so the PowerPoint is, what is surplus? Um, it's a presentation to describe the different types of surplus that fall within the total accumulated surplus on the financial statements. And on the documents that Tracy's um, sending around the consolidated statement of financial position or what was formerly known as a balance sheet has what's called the accumulated surplus at the bottom of that sheet because it no longer called a balance sheet because it no longer balances to zero as it did previously it's just formatted a little different to show you what happens um, with the equity within an organization so the top section is your assets. The next part is your liabilities. Um, and the financial assets are thought to be a little more uh, easily liquefied. So it's something that you can turn into cash fairly readily. And again, the liabilities, so that's your debt, um, your outstanding uh, accounts payable, some deferred revenue, which is grants that you haven't um, met the criteria to spend yet, and the liability for the post-closure costs. And then there's the non-financial assets, and those are the assets that aren't as readily turned into cash. And one of those that, you know, likely isn't able to turn into cash, even if we tried really, really hard, nobody's going to buy a bridge or a road, or um, because really it's just a liability. It's, it's of, of no value to anyone except us on our financial statements. Um, and the people that use it. Yes, and the people that use it, but that yeah. Um, inventories for consumption, which the majority of that is gravel and a small amount of prepaid expenses. So um, I just want to note here that well, let's get, let's get into the different types of surpluses. So that's the next uh, slide. And my favorite picture on here is that potato with the road on it. I'm not sure. My kids, when I was doing this, I was doing it at home, and <laughs> they were like, what is that potato with the road on it? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, so there's in, within that accumulated surplus, which is that bottom number, there's different types of surpluses. And when we talk about surplus, it's not like you think of surplus. It's not like it's extra. It's not like uh, the, the example I gave here is the Army and Navy surplus store. Um, they sell the extra supplies, right? But when you're talking about surplus on a, on a financial statement, it really means equity. It really means the, the surplus of your assets over your what you owe, over your liabilities. Um, and this number means something differently for a municipality than it does for you personally. So for you personally, if your equity increases in your house, that gives you more borrowing um, limit. If your equity in your house goes um, up because you've paid on your mortgage um, over time, your house is worth more. Roads don't ever get to be worth more. Um, so we never, the municipality never sees an increase in equity due to um, an increase in value. Um, only ever a depreciation. And it doesn't affect our borrowing limits. It's not like the, um, when we go to borrow money, they say, oh, how much equity do you have in your assets? No. Our borrowing limit is determined by the amount of revenue that we generate. 
room. My mouth's getting a little dry. If if I could have a question around our our assets or those tangible capital yep. assets out there, they <laughs> how do I describe this? They get put in at, at a certain level, and then they will be depreciated as time moves on. There is mm -hmm. no never a, a reassessment of those that that they would be more in an equity position. No. So what happens is uh, what they're put on the balance sheet um, as is what it costs to build them, with the exception of 2009 when uh, the provincial government legislated that municipalities needed to start putting roads and bridges on um, as assets, which municipalities had never put them on as assets before. Um, then there was uh, the pr province issued a whole big book about how to value uh, a road and a bridge um, that you'd had for 50 years and hadn't put any money into it. Um, but other than that, now going forward, if we spend three and a half million dollars on a bridge, that's how it shows up on your financial statements, three, three and a half million. And then we decide, well, that bridge will likely last 75 or 80 years. And that's, we just divide it by 80, take 1 of the of the cost that it, of that bridge, and that's the depreciation for that bridge per year. So the value of that bridge would decrease by 1 80th until we get to the 80th year, and then it's at valued at zero. Am I correct in saying that then we account for that depreciation in that amortization type yes. concept we use? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Deputy Reeve Milhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, a lot of urbans are now capitalizing their natural assets. Is that something that we can look into doing? Can you give me an example? Um, they count how many trees and they put a value to them and use them as the part of their bottom line. <laughs> well, I'm not even kidding. They legitimately do that. Inventory and serial yes. number? Yeah. They are inventorying the natural capital areas within their municipalities, <laughs> i.e. I I think the I city see a hiring Edmonton. scheme coming up. I'm just saying, the city of Edmonton does that very thing. And, and I'm not saying we should do that for the entire West Country. That would be silly. But we are planting and paying for trees to be planted within the hamlet of Nordegg, for example. That there is a cash exchange happening within some of the areas where we do. And we're planting, you told us, $500 a tree and less leave it. Like, these, these are capital assets that we potentially should be considering. Uh, if we planted an individual tree, it wouldn't be our capital threshold. We have an amount that we would would um, capitalize over. Um, otherwise, we it, it still gets put through the uh, income statement and shows as an expense. Um, if it doesn't hit the the capital threshold, um, some of those trees are capitalized because they are part of a larger project. Yeah. And if if that project comes in at $3 million, then those trees are included in there. So even though we don't track them separately, um, some of them would be capitalized. If we just planted a tree on the main street of Leslieville and it cost us $200, we wouldn't capitalize that. It's, just, it's interesting how they're doing yeah. entire natural programs as part yeah. of their um, capitalization now within yeah. urban centers. Yeah. Um, uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, the city of Edmonton actually has an assigned forester with an office and staff. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Are we increasing uh, Director Martinson's <laughs> I am, resources? I'm, I'm not proposing any such thing. <laughs> Could, could you talk a bit about how we deal with this depreciation of ridges and Sure. You know, how that reflects in these numbers. Sure. So on that first page, there you'll see um, tangible capital assets, note nine. And in 2020, it went from 350000 to 364. Now what, oh, on that first page there. Yep. Yep. It's just under um, non-financial assets. Okay. So... How that number goes from 350 to 364 
isn't just, oh, we added $14,000 worth of assets. What happens is, um, and the estimation for depreciation continues to rise year over year just due to the amount of assets that are being purchased and the cost of them rising over the last time we purchased them, right? So when you buy, uh, when you build a bridge this year, um, maybe cost four million and the last time we built it only cost one. So um, the, the cost of your TCA goes, goes up. So then the, the amount that gets amortized increases year over year that you're purchasing assets. So when it goes from 350,000 to 364, that's the amortization. You take that off the 350,000, which ours is over 20 million a year, and then increased that 20 million plus an additional 14. So you're seeing that um, an increase in your in your net financial or uh, tangible capital assets as being a positive. It means you're building more assets that year than you're using, which you should be because you're using them at the rate you paid for them, some of them 50 years ago. So um, to rebuild those is quite a bit more costly than, um, than the amortization of the old one. So there should be a net increase in your tangible capital assets year over year. If you are keeping up with replacing and making sure that you have those assets to provide those services uh, into the future. How do we know that we're replacing that? Uh, setting aside surpluses or, or building surpluses to replace those? That's this exercise over the next two days. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. So again, there's different types of assets that make up that accumulated surplus or equity for Clearwater County. So there's cash, which you can see in the, on that top line, cash and cash equivalents, $65 million. It decreased um, over last year, over the year before, but you can see in the investments line below, uh, three lines below that, went from 37 to 43. So even though we used some, the, the cash did decrease that year because we, we purchased um, or built constructed assets. Um, it, it did decrease some, but not as much as just the cash and cash equivalents. There's a lot of different moving parts. There's inventory, which is mostly gravel, um, which if the, the county decided they're no longer gonna be in business, they could sell and that could get turned into cash. And then the tangible capital assets portion. And some of that, what we call cash, might be accounts receivable. Um, you know, it might be somebody that, that uh, or taxes receivable, um, that's on the books that we say, yes, we're going to collect that. It's, it's not necessarily cash. All of these line items that are on this um, statement of financial position go into that, figuring out what that bottom line number is, right? Luckily, we have um, about the same amount of cash and investments as we have equity in restricted surplus. So it's really close to 100% funded through cash um, because what the um, inventories and accounts receivable are going to fund is the accounts payable that we had at the end of the year. Um, any debt, so we still have an outstanding loan to, uh, for the Westview Lodge project, and um, the liability for the landfill, which is like 30 plus years into the future, so we don't need cash for that right now, right? Okay, so I, think, I feel like I spent a lot of time on that. Oh good, the next three slides are breaking it up. So accumulated surplus is the total of the equity um, accumulated over time within the organization. And like I said, there was three different sections. Um, there's equity and TCA, which when we talk about restricted surplus, we just remove that whole amount out because we didn't have, for one thing, 
Clearwater County is lucky. We don't have any debt on any of our capital assets. So the equity we have in those assets is exactly the value of those assets. So we don't have to worry about doing a calculation to figure out, well, do we owe any money on them? And, and is the equity right? Um, because we would have to pay money on debt. No, we don't. It's the exact same. So we just remove that out of the equation when we're talking about restricted surplus because we can't use a bridge or a road to pay for a future project. Restricted surplus is the worth of the equity or value of the assets above the liabilities, which I just described. Luckily, Clearwater County is 100, almost 100% 100 uh, cash backed for restricted surplus. And then we have a small amount in unrestricted surplus. And this is just a calculated number. Like once we, um, once Clearwater County restricts all of its uh, surpluses to a particular project, and that's done on purpose, um, there's many projects that need funding. Um, we want to make sure that, that those priorities are being funded. And um, we leave a very small amount in unrestricted surplus. And mostly it's for tweaking the financial statements. So um, the last few days, it's all about timing. So did this happen in this year? Did it happen in next year? Or, um, and that amount of surplus changes slightly every time they regenerate the statements. So there just needs to be a little bit of a cushion there so that we can um, change the number of the surplus without affecting your projects that you've restricted. So what is Clearwater County surplus? Oh, we talked about that. I think we're gonna skip that slide. So let's get into the restricted surplus accounts. So what I've done, um, over the last little bit is organize the restricted surplus accounts into types because I felt like to begin with, it, this has happened over time. Maybe we had five restricted surplus accounts. So it's easy to see, okay, yeah, this is for that, this is for that. And then as time went on, oh, we'll add one here, we'll add one there, and it just got added onto the end of the spreadsheet, right? So we wanted to see and organize what types of things the county is um, setting aside funds for. So county facilities, you can see there that there's six different restricted surpluses for county facilities. The agrec facility sitting at 4.7 million, the airport facility sitting at 943,000. Cell development, which is one that I, I really I uh, want the strategic planning committee to talk about, not that I don't want you to talk about all the rest, but what's happened since regional waste dissolved is that they used to set aside money every year for the next cell. And that has discontinued since um, this landfill has come under um, Clearwater County's uh, direct control. So uh, I think it's just that the next step we need to take is to figure out um, the cell development um, amount, what year we think we need to develop that cell and how much we have to put away every year to, to um, develop that cell in the year that it needs to be developed and ensuring that we are recouping those costs from the uh, landfill usage. Fire facilities, um, fire training facilities, which is different because that is the deployment revenue that um, the firefighters, when they go uh, and are deployed, we've set that aside in a separate uh, account and that has gone to fund um, all of those fire training facilities. And then the administration facility is sitting at 13 million. So even though, you know, it, when I started this exercise of kind of grouping them together, I was actually surprised that there was six surplus accounts for facilities, which it shouldn't. We need facilities to um, offer services, but. So the next set is the general or the stabilization funding. So the work in progress is um, just those um, projects that get, that don't have a specific restricted surplus, but we've taxed for it in the year that, um, the previous year and we don't want to tax for it again. So we put that into the work in progress and pull the money out in the, in the next year. The stabilization fund 
um, which has been called the tax rate stabilization fund. And I'm not sure that that is entirely accurate. I don't think we are stabilizing the county's revenues just to try to keep the rate stabilized. I think we're trying to stabilize the revenue, not just the rate. The rate could change and the revenue not change at all. So uh, GIS is the, the air photos, which I think uh, needs a discussion also, um, just so that you know we, we don't fly every year. So we just put that money aside year over year to make sure that we have enough on the year we fly so we don't see that large expenditure one year and then none for two or three. Uh, the leachate restricted surplus, now it, it, we inherited that from the waste um, dissolution. And when it was put into practice through the regional system, um, it was to buffer those years where leachate was, um, was heavily, uh, leachate removal was heavily needed. We had a big rain year or whatever. And I'm not sure that that's uh, as necessary. Again, needs a discussion of, of the committee. Um, leachate, that wouldn't affect Clearwater County as much as it would affect our partners when we were um, uh, in the partnership. So um, again, just something we should talk about. Is that a restricted surplus we still need? Um, or could we um, absorb those higher years just in the year that they happen? Um, we changed the name of the disaster uh, restricted surplus to emergency preparedness. So it's at $2 million. Uh, land development. There's currently two accounts. Nordegg development sitting at just, um, it's getting so close to net, you guys. A million dollars owed to the county. Um, public Works uh, Capital is uh, sitting at 2.8 for um, industrial and commercial land development. Municipal Rec and School, there's kind of two funds in this one. One is the Rec School and MR, which um, there was a million dollars put in that for um, to match funding for one of the school developments. And then um, one called North Saskatchewan River Park. I added and trails and I hope that that's um, all right. Again, discussion, what you think that there's only $28,000 left in that fund. Um, but I think as a, um, that project's just gonna just morph into that trail to the, um, in that area. So it seems like a good fit. And also just to mention the rec school and MR is noted to be spent in 2024, less civil rec grounds, or 2023? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Roads and bridges, um, kind of core infrastructure, um, what we would call core infrastructure, there's five of them. Uh, one, that core infrastructure fund, the public works paving fund, West Country Roads, um, resource roads and bridge infrastructure. And again, all of them are being estimated or being spent in the next few years. So um, those are some of the projects that we'll need to talk about as we go through um, the detail of the five years and find out um, you know, what we would have to put in those restricted surpluses to cover what staff has identified should really be coming out of those restricted surplus accounts. Public works paving's in there, yeah. And then utilities, which is regional sewer, um, it's, which there's a project like ongoing right now that's using that funding. Leslieville sewer, which is just the, um, the reason it's called Leslieville sewer is because that's the only um, utility that's actually generating revenue above what it costs to operate. Um, so um, past council decided to put that, anything that was generated from the operations of that utility should go into its own restricted surplus account to fund any future capital that might be needed there. And then I didn't know where to put broadband. <laughs> so we, we plunked it into the utilities kind of category. 
and again, even to finish, I think the core backbone, um, something like $3 million and there's only 932 sitting in there, so. Um, vehicles and equipment. There's one for the, what we would call the lighter duty vehicles and equipment. Um, regional waste, again, we inherited uh, a small restricted surplus, our portion of the, that. Um, probably should just get put into the vehicles and equipment. Oh, sorry, that vehicles and equipment, I guess, is more than just the lighter duty stuff. So it's everything. And then the fire apparatus, um, one is separate. And then public works and uh, gravel and gravel reclamation. And those two actually are the only two that we're not seeing uh, be depleted. Uh, there is uh, one project for uh, gravel um, uh, purchase. So that's uh, having, uh, getting more stores using that public works gravel one. Um, the gravel reclamation, we budget 200,000 to come out of there every year and budget about 200,000 to go back in with the use of the gravel, um, the excess that we charge out to the projects that's above what it costs to crush. Um, we put that to the, um, to the project because we need to do the reclamation of the pits and that should get costed out to the project. It's an estimation, so it's not exactly right. Um, because we don't have that information. But um, the other thing is that uh, we've noted in the last couple of years, which it's, it's on our to-do list, we just haven't, haven't got there, is to, to do a, a, a more in-depth gravel, look at the gravel reclamation that is out there from what uh, gravel usage uh, Clearwater County has in its pits, which I think like there's 13 or 14 pits. So. Um, a question I would would have for that. I, uh, my understanding that we already have an existing hundred year supply of of gravel resources uh, and and a, a fund to purchase additional ones sitting at four point four million. Uh, does that allow some flexibility with that fund to be um, repurposed perhaps, or um, I, there's a sizable amount. I know there's a separate thing for reclamation as well as uh, you know, a separate fund for purchasing new and, and just uh, looking at our immediate needs and our future needs and uh, trying to find that balance. Yeah, I, if, um, if it was determined that we likely wouldn't need to purchase any more gravel stores, of course, any of these restricted surplus accounts are just a restriction on uh, via motion through council. So uh, any of them, any that council wishes to change or um, move around is totally at their discretion. Okay, thank you. And again, that second page lists all the restricted surpluses and their amounts at the end of 2021. The spreadsheet that I'll, I'll pass around today will have some estimations for what's going on in the 2022 year end. Um, and then some projections for further out um, based on the work that the uh, teams have been doing, um, trying to project, you know, for the 10 year capital for this exercise. That being said, it'll be a really major work in progress. We'll um, be uh, likely modifying that, uh, it, the information that goes into that document over the next couple days. So. And that's the end of the restricted surplus um, presentation. What I wanted really was to help you understand um, what those restricted surpluses, how we, where, where does the money come from that's in them? Um, how does that relate to our financial statements? And um, help council understand too was just that last comment that these are all based on council motions and uh, as we go through the projects and the priorities for each of the departments, um, we look to um, confirm or change any of the priorities that you see in, the, in that 10 year capital plan. And um, you know, from there, then we will identify, you know, kind of what um, hopefully by the end of the day, I can get, uh, end of the day tomorrow, I can gather some of that information 
and show you uh, a little bit about what it would take to um, fund uh, all of these projects and what an annual transfer to restricted surplus would look like to ensure that the projects that are on this 10-year capital plan um, are funded. So with that... Um, oh, sorry, a uh, question yep. from Deputy Reeve Mailhoff. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Reeve. I think that that would be really important to see kind of where, what our future is going to look like yes. and how it's going to be funded. Um, and I particularly noticed that during budget where we annually fund fire equipment at, you know, 800,000, but public works equipment, I believe was a hundred thousand yen yeah. annually, 150. I like discrepancies like that, a, a greater, a snow plow, a, pl a plow truck, all of those things, they're, they're important too. And we know what those costs are going to be in almost perpetuity given, unless we obviously build more roads, et cetera. Um, I think we need to look at what that yearly contribution should be. So I'm looking forward to uh, yes. bringing that forward to us because that's important. I guess one of the um, past practices has been that for things that happen year over year at approximately the same cost doesn't necessarily go into restricted surplus and come out. And a really good example of that is Public Works' is gravel road rehab. You know. It, they have a certain amount that they spend a year. They don't go over that amount. And uh, it's looked at every year to, to, at one time it was to determine, you know, to do 20 kilometers, I believe, in a year of gravel road rehab. Um, the trouble with keeping some of it as tax revenue and some of it as restricted surplus is we don't see the whole big picture. And I think even if it has to go into restricted surplus and come out that same year, it shows that Clearwater County has a plan. There's a plan for why um, these tax revenues are generated. There's a, there's a designation for them. We're seeing where they're going. And then in the year that, um, that it's supposed to come out, it comes out. You know, you're not just putting money into restricted surplus to, um, to have a big savings pot that won't be spent for the next 20 years. You know, it's for a specific purpose. And when that purpose comes, that money comes out. So, um, and I think that will help. Um, I think, you know, those, those dollars have grown um, over the last few years. There's some big projects on the books, right? And um, because there hasn't been a lot coming out maybe in the last few years, it, there, there gets to be some anxiety about spending those funds. And um, we want to ensure that those funds are being put for the project that's on your priority list and that when that project comes up, that those funds are used for what it's intended, right? So um, I think it, there is some benefits to putting those funds in and having them come out every year, just so that when we say that the total that got transferred to restricted surplus is what we're spending for, for um, as a total on capital uh, infrastructure in that year. Those, those funds are the funds that were designated for capital Maybe they don't get spent in that year. Maybe it's five years. But that, that total is the total amount of the tax revenue in that year that gets designated to um, future, current and future TCA. Okay. There's no other questions. I'm going to turn it over to one of the directors. We didn't really talk about who's going to go first or anything. Um, anybody want to jump up and volunteer? <laughs> Oh, I'm seeing a nervousness there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. First lamb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. Well, you're right up first on the on the agenda item anyway. We'll bring the first lamb forward. So that's page <laughs> page 32 of 229 on the capital project detail documents. Well, the summer, do you want to go through the summary first, Eric, or how do you want to do this? Um, I'll, I'll zoom in a more. Okay. A biological zoomers aren't working very good. No. <laughs> yeah, mine either. And I don't so, think I have my... Is this the project? This is the funding list. Yeah, so maybe maybe we'll go to the project um, uh, 
I think that's page 32, right? Whoops. Page 32. Whoops, sorry. 5.2, page 32. So I guess, just as a, can, uh, Tracy, can we light Eric's mic up? Light you up? <laughs> well, uh, good morning. Now we can hear you too. Perfect. So, so just as a preamble there, um, I'm, I'm going to say this is a, uh, it's the draft uh, version of our projected 2024 budget and beyond our 10-year capital plan. Um, answer to your question from before, we have uh, put in some inflationary numbers there for some of the ones that we can project. Some of them are, are fairly static, um, but one of the, the, the main uh, principles we tried to use as we're going through the funding strategy, which has been different from historically, is that a lot of these um, public works utility items that have been uh, were typically funded through tax revenue so they weren't um, uh, there wasn't identified uh, restricted surplus that was used they were just typically added on to the, the it didn't really fit in a restricted surplus category so historically they've always just been added on to tax revenue was the funding sources and every year when we do up the tally you know I think it really kind of got absorbed into our revenue that we have versus the revenue that we need to spend or our expenditures. And then we were looking at um, our restricted surplus just to basically deal with maybe some of the larger items that needed, uh, that was easier to um, allocate um, larger funds from, whether it be uh, tax rate stabilization or a specific reserve. So we've uh, the exercise that, that I did um, included anything that kind of fell into that category of where it historically would have been tax revenue um, got lumped into that core infrastructure. So we're talking about roper pumps in, in Nordeg. It's, it's not part of the Nordeg plan or we get put to Nordeg. This is a public works expense that would normally would have get uh, funded through tax revenue. Now that those types of capital items have gone through the core infrastructure. And it came very apparent quickly that um, underfunded was the theme of most of the, the, the sur restricted surpluses that as we're gonna go through these. Um, so it's going to be important to, um, you know, as we, you know, there's the program first, you know, we check the box, is it still important? Yes. And what the impact is on that restricted surplus and how much money we need to put away. So how that, how that all gets put together in the end is, um, but today I can, I can certainly talk about um, the programs, projects. I, we've gone through this numerous times with a lot of them, so I'll try to go, say, fairly high level, you know, just check those boxes there and then we can really start diving into the numbers toward the end, I think. Um, right off the, the hop, that's our road construction in Min. We've talked about this numerous times as our construction staff um, capitalized. You know, we've had that discussion as well as why it's capitalized. Um, sorry. Maybe I'll just turn it over to the chair for a second. There's a oh, so, so sorry. Um, I was trying to look through my program. Um, I, I just wanted to recuse ahead, myself please. for this first item here. Okay. So yeah, we're not projecting any uh, major staff increases in our in our uh, in for our staff or to complete our capital projects. So um, those numbers do get adjusted through. You know, basically that indicates that we have a, a senior staff contingent, so there's not a whole lot of room to grow on the grid. Only adjustments would typically be done through um, uh, cost of living increases year to year. So that's, um, that's a static um, expenditure for the next 10 years and um, typically funded through tax revenue. But again, it would be an in and out um, every year. It's a pretty um, consistent item. There's nothing else or questions about this one, we can go on to the next one. I will try to keep it up, maybe even more brief. I'll turn this one over to Kurt there for Airport Capital. Yeah, so again, these are projects identified uh, by our managing partner. Uh, 
town of Rocky Mountain House. And um, uh, the major one being obviously the construction of the terminal building in 2024. Um, so that's our 50% share. So what you're seeing there is a 50% share uh, in regards to each of those years with the uh, uh, right now, uh, they did give us only up to 2032. Um, I'm sure we'll see come uh, budget, budget deliberations for uh, the year 2024. We'll be presented with an update in regards to what potentially could be coming uh, in addition to the year 2033. Uh, so what you're seeing there uh, uh, reflects that. Um, I'm just working on the number right now in regards to the uh, deficit. I know according to what uh, Rhonda has provided us with, we're currently sitting and uh, I'm just going based off the number on the handout that uh, our uh, restricted surplus for airport is more or less 980,000 a year. So obviously there'll have to be some additional funding put in place uh, in regards to if you want to uh, utilize the airport restricted surplus and have that pay for the majority of the projects upcoming over the next 10 years, we'll need to top that up a little bit as well or do a combination of uh, the airport restricted surplus and tax revenue. Um, Deputy Reeve, mail hub, please. Thank you, Reeve. Do we have a rough estimate yet of how much the terminal building is going to cost? I know at one point a million was being thrown around, but we're doing detailed drawings this year. Are, how is that all going? Yeah. Other than what was presented to us uh, during uh, prior to budget deliberations and the documentation there, I've heard nothing yet in regards to any further progress on that. But once we do, definitely that will be shared. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any additional questions on this this item. So, our asphalt overlay program. Um, I alluded that the uh, the budget deliberations. We were going to revisit our strategy with our asphalt overlay. We've um, the new estimates that we've created for our ten year plan include that we're looking at a 20 year life cycle for our band free surface roads uh, with a 15 year life cycle on our, our band surfaces. The ones are not quite up to the structure. Um, it's always historically been a philosophy of council to try to get uh, the mobility of our industry and agricultural users up to 100%. It's in our policy that that's our goal is to, is to strive for you know, band free structures. So. And of course, with the, the lighter structures, they do tend to have a little bit of a more of a reduced life. So we've maintained that same 15 year life cycle for the, the structures that are reduced. Um, with a 20 year life cycle, the, anything new that's constructed to a band free standard, um, hopefully we can get through good maintenance, um, some other maintenance items such as uh, seal coats or microsurfacing or something that we can extend those, uh, that life cycle of those, uh, those roads up to that 20 year to try to stretch out the, the dollars over the years. Um, we know that we're, we're continuing to, to pave um, so that you know, we used to be 300 and, uh, uh, 341 kilometers of surface road was the number that we had for years. But if we, you know, with the Ochis Road looming, the addition of uh, River Road, Les of East, you know, our, our kilometers of, of surface roads in the municipality are, are, are climbing. Um, I'm going to still say it's comparable to our neighbors, um, Red Deer County, uh, Lacombe County. It's all right at that three to four hundred kilometers is, is about what they have for a, a surface road infrastructure. Um, now, for a funding source, um, discussions with with Rhonda is the use of the, the gas tax fund because it's it really um, easy to paint a box around those types of contracts. Um, it fits within the criteria. It's typically utilized every year. That way we can uh, say, tick the boxes on the grant application. So we have, um, there was some surplus amount of uh, 
federal gas tax funds that was left over to be utilized. We we're looking at uh, using that for the program for next year. Um, I believe there was an error on my part. I only had 400 or 4 million of it funded out of a $6 million program. So I, my adjustments would include that we would use the balance from MSI to, so it would be completely grant funded to, to fund our asphalt overlay program. There again, it's a long-term investment. It fits well into the uh, criteria for the, for that grant. So that would be, um, my recommendation that we continue to utilize the MSI money there to enhance and support our surface road infrastructure. Uh, Deputy Reeve Mailhoff, and then I'll have a question as well. Uh, thank, thank you, Reeve. Um, do we have a system other than just every 15 years or 20 years, rather than just putting a number on them? For example, Camrose, the town of Cam and I know we can't do the same thing, we're just too big, um, but they mapped out their entire town. They brought in like a, a vehicle that went around and mapped every pothole to actually determine a priority list of when they had to do everything, not just basing it on asphalt's good for 15 years whether it's been driven on or not. Like, I, do we have a system in place so that we're not asphalting where it's not needed or maybe doing it early if it is needed? Uh, we do not have that, uh, that type of scientific method today um, utilized. We do, of course, before we, we go into a program, we do um, do a condition rating there. Our engineers are actually in the process of doing that for next year right now. And they provide us a, a uh, perspective to say that it does this road need to be done? Yes, or could it? Could be, you know, um, could have, could have wait two more years. Yes, um, one of our goals has really been is to, or again, is to try to get up our structures up to being a band free. So we've really adopted, you know, spacing it out. We, we have to create a plan, so that's why we know that regardless of what the scientific data was supports of the year prior, we know that we're going to have to spend um, so much money over a course of ten years. So that's really where this comes from, and then specifically we adjust what needs to be done, which roads need to be done the year prior. So it's through, a, through an engineering assessment. Okay, thank you. And I guess my question would have, uh, relates to one of the dynamics happening within our road network, with, that's twinning of Highway 11. I know that will probably create a number of considerations with paving and having additional sections of isolated uh, paved roads that may have to come to a decision. Has, has that been included in any of this planning? And if it hasn't, how do we include it? As well as I've heard some feedback from the community, I'll just say it more specifically with the, the new corridor schools of having alternative paved routes that uh, might tie those two schools together has been mentioned in the community. I know it's not in the uh, long range plans, but how do we adapt to changing dynamics as we move forward. Yeah, so there's, um, I, I hear two different uh, subject matters actually being mentioned in, in your question. One would be um, asphalt overlay, how we um, evaluate our roads compared to what other pressures are, like from the province, the twinning. The best example is 752 access has been needing to be overlaid now for a few years, but with the the twinning looming and what the impacts would be on the intersection, you know, we, we don't want to lose any investment, you know, even 30, 40 meters of, of asphalt as we've seen what the, the prices are. Um, we don't want to lose that type of investment. So as even um, the Highway 11 corridor heading east, we know that there's going to be an impact on the, the Timey Road, Arbutus Road, Oris Road. Uh, we want to make sure, you know, now that we have somewhat of a plan from the functional planning studies saying that it's going to be twinned in place now, whether it be on the north side or the south side, I will have an impact on on which roads we should do. Um, so if, if it was on the north side, we want to watch how it impacts uh, Timey Road or Oris, for example. Or if it was on the south, then it would be Arbutus or Wall Street. Um, so that is definitely being taken into account. And now that we do have somewhat of a plan through the functional planning study, uh, actually our, our engineers were in attendance to the meeting in, in Sylvan to start having a look at what their potential impacts are. But really, until it gets into the detailed design, you know, a functional planning study is best guess here today. It'll, it'll, it'll be adjusted, I'm sure, through, through time of which side of, of Highway 11 the twinning is going to occur on. And we'll be, um, again, the farther it gets more into detail and a, and a true plan, we'll definitely be at the table there to consider how it impacts our infrastructure. Now, in regards to the second part of your question, um, corridor schools, another transportation route, really that falls into the world of a 
um, maybe a base pave project there. One I could think of would be, of course, Condor North up to less of the least. It's going to be a highly used uh, area for bus traffic and um, people commuting from in between the schools. Um, instead of on, instead of using a divided highway to to get over to those other um, to as another access point, I guess. So um, as we're going through that priority list, we do not have a mechanism today to add roads to the base pave list. We have an outstanding project, um, only one that's on our 10 year capital plan, which is the uh, Burnstick Lake Road going south to the to the campground. Um, and even at that, when we get to that item in this list, we'll see that's actually the paving reserve is underfunded even to support that project. So if we want additional um, paving projects to be added, um, that being one, and if there's other um, wish list Paid. construction items that, that want to be added to the list, I would say this is the time to get everybody's um, project list on the table and start seriously talking about the funding strategy for these underfunded items. Right. Thank you for that, because it's certainly been um, presented to me by members of the community. Well, when is that being done? And the answer I have is it hasn't been considered up to this point, so maybe that's an opportunity today for this committee to look at some of the wish list uh, things they may have within their own divisions as well as we move into the future, because this is the planning moment. Uh, Councillor Graham, please. Well, we're on that topic. I've heard from that road as well that a lot of people would like to see it paved now with the, the realigning with the schools and everything. So just to echo your, your comments. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Swanson, please, and then I'll come to Deputy Reed Mill. Through time, traffic patterns do change, and we've noticed that with, with the new schools and then the impact now that the, the twinning of Highway 11. How does our county identify the new connector routes? Because the new connector roads change over time, and that that does impact um, these capital projects that we are, you know, whether it be base pave or overlay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how, how, how are we identifying that? Is it through just through traffic counts, like th that, that, that we do every year, or how, how, are you, how is your department identifying those connector routes? So every year we do invest in um, traffic counts throughout our municipality. Um, through experience and knowledge of our councillors and staff, we can definitely, we can see where some of the pattern changes are. We haven't seen really a significant amount of, of development that would drive changing um, traffic patterns. You know, we've been, our industrial uh, base, you know, as you'll see intensive um, traffic patterns when it comes to well drilling, but it's only temporary. We haven't seen any new gas plants come up or fertilizer um, plants or even, um, you know, a lot of those developments have actually been focused to stay along a major highway corridor or like a, off a primary highway and a road that's already um, existing. We can certainly, um, like we're gonna monitor and they say traffic count again, the, the access in between say Cor uh, Condor North right, and to see if there is a a traffic increase. Ultimately, those the, the school locations haven't changed, but now the use has because of the you know the elimination of uh, the David Thompson School off the highway to see what that pattern will look like. Of course, as a gravel standard road, people will be tend to avoid that section. They'll probably stay to the highway unless that you know that if it was paved, they will come. But uh, I would even. I'd be, you'd have to do an analytics for a couple of years to see what the traffic patterns were to see if it actually fit within, you know, if we're seeing 300, 250, 300 vehicles a day going north <coughs> on Condor Road, then it would definitely become a higher priority. But with those schools just being freshly constructed, um, it would take some time to analyze that data to, to support that. As for anywhere else, um, um, the still one of the highest paving priorities when it comes to uh, utilization traffic counts are still the Ochis Road. That's one of our highest utilized gravel roads throughout the municipality at 500 vehicles a day. Uh, Deputy Reeve Milhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I had sent an email a number of weeks ago regarding a couple of, of my wish list items. Um, in particular, one uh, Range Road 7-2 south on the 752 access, um, particularly with the paving 
of Highway 11 giving more access to town, um, I think would be, would be prudent and perhaps that's something we can start working with the town on to look at see if that's something they want to do. It's my understanding we already have that road right away. Um, and the other one that I had mentioned, or the easement rather, um, and the other one that I had mentioned was the Clearwater Estates, them only having one um, emergency access egress route. Um, and perhaps because of the Highway 1120 again, now would be the best time to look at what that uh, secondary access egress could look like for that community. We can, I have comments, I guess, on both of them if you want to start the conversation today. Um, so seven, mm -hmm. uh, can I interrupt? Mr. Hand, please. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's these two days are definitely when we want to hear your, um, uh, projects that aren't on the priority list that are going to be on. Um, I would um, prefer if Public Works got through or the departments got through their projects that are currently on the list and then tomorrow um, if you come prepared with your lists and then we will um, speak to them after we get through um, all the, the projects that are on uh, the list currently. To be Is fair, he said wish list, so I, I pulled mine up. That's right, Just he did. <laughs> no, we do so, definitely so. want to know the projects that need to get added to the priority list, um, and I do want to speak to that a little bit before we, we go in that direction. I'd love to look at what one's um, administration thinks can be deleted as well. Okay. Sure. Sure, that might be a great, a great way to combine all the material we have to have to view over the next number of hours uh, and to get as much accomplished as possible um, and avoid rabbit holes. But nonetheless, this is a great time to actually have the discussion about the discussion that's coming up. So please continue on, Mr. Uh, Hanson, please. Do we get up the... Back to the, there we go, thank you. So I believe the, um, the format that is going to be included <coughs> is that I've identified a 10 year plan worth of asphalt overlay with the funding strategy coming from, a majority from MSI. Um, Mr. Ann already identified that I might be too ambitious with the funding strategy. Um, of course, there's always, again, back to tax revenue, uh, has been our default as the um, supplemental um, funding strategy for most of our projects. So I'd, assuming, I'd assume that would be consistent uh, moving forward, but the majority of, of the uh, projects, you know, $5 million a year, I think is what I've identified, plus or minus there over the course with is an inflationary amount that we have added, you know, between so much a kilometer for the next three years and then with an inflationary amount to go up. Um, there again, approximately $5 million a year, primarily funded through MSI. Okay. And maybe I should, oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Councillor Swanson, go ahead. Um, in specifically to this particular road, the Wall Street Road, um, if we were to partner with Red Deer County, they do paving to a ban free status like we do, correct? Uh, which status, sorry? The, they do to ban free, paving to a ban free status as well. So the, I'm just thinking of like the Rainy Creek Road, how it just goes from one, flows from one county to another and there's that uh, speed limit change. This, going down this particular, will there be a speed limit change? Do they have a different <laughs> speed limit than we do? Is there a different speed limit standard? Oh, speed limits. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, can we put that in the parking lot too? We want to talk about speed limits because our we we've had that uh, Rainy Creek Road evaluated for the speed limit, and it is it is signed appropriately due to the the uh, the sight lines. Um, it could be argued that the other portion may be even signed a little bit too high. I won't, I haven't confirmed that, but. Um, Something for Red Deer County ICC maybe? Uh, no, no, I, I, it's, it's, they're gonna do what they do, and then we do what we do. So, um, now in regards to uh, Wall Street Road, actually that does stem back, that's strategically in 2025, because Red Deer County's eagerly uh, waiting to um, jump onto our contract 
to get their portion of the gravel portion south to Highway 54 paved. So um, every year, Marty phones me up and says, you, you still doing 2025? Still doing 2025? And um, so far, the answer has been yes, until this council tells me otherwise. And we're getting closer. Um, but they, are, they want to line up their base pay project with our overlay for their, again, cost savings that it can create. Yeah. And Councillor Ratcliffe, please. Thank you. Um, do I understand from what you said that um, we're trying to do approximately 23 kilometers per year of, of pavement overlay? And that's about five million a year? Approximately, yep. Approximately. Okay, thank you. All right. Oh, uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Sorry, thank you. Anything that was seemed to be consistent and year after year, I thought that Ms. Sirhan said to spun from tax revenue because it's consistent year after year after year. These are coming from MSI funding. <coughs> Mr. Hagen, please. Thank you, Reva. Maybe a couple of comments on that. Um, come from tax revenue, yes, if we can't identify a grant revenue source or a restricted surplus account to draw from, the default becomes tax revenue. Uh, what Ms. Sirhan was also referring to is that past practice has been to use that default of tax revenue. And what we're suggesting is a bit of a paradigm shift towards funding restricted surplus accounts and then drawing them down for these capital projects <coughs> wherever we possibly can. Okay. So suggesting a change that would move us more towards that. And I suggest what that demonstrates both <coughs> to the ratepayers and to the provincial government is that we're actively planning and using these restricted surplus accounts. As Ms. Arhan said, they're not just surplus money that we put away for whatever. There are specific purposes and we can show the actual action and, and carrying out that planning into actual projects, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. And maybe if I could note as well, it's been noted as MSI funding as we move forward. That's not to say there's a giant pot of MSI money that's sitting there. It will be something that's transitioning into the new funding formula, LGFF. Uh, formula that we're anticipating is going to be our stable predictable funding source uh, as we move into the future with the uh, province. Okay, I see nods of uh, acknowledgement there. So, um, Mr. Hansen, please. So, uh, Burnstick Lake Road's been identified at 26, uh, again, strategically to line up with the asphalt overlay on the, um, the portion from Highway 54 South. There again, if we can take an opportunity to combine that, the, the base pay project with the overlay project, um, we all, we're always looking at ways that we can try to combine projects for to maximize the, the value. There again, if it stays on the paving priority list, um, you know, perhaps it could be moved around a little bit more on the, the overlay um, strategy, but that's the primary reason why it's in 2026. 20, in 2027 and beyond, it's there again. It's it's best guess based on the on the life cycle of asphalt. I don't think it's worth going through each and every one of them. Other than the fact that it's like saying, around around a five million dollar investment with some with some bubbles because we did we did, we heavily invested in, in our asphalt overlay 2009 2010 and there was years that we actually doubled the program because of we had some significant um, cost savings there with the asphalt prices that we were seeing at the time. If that opportunity presents itself again in the future, you know, perhaps we could do that again, but we'll have that conversation when we get there. So if we could skip on past asphalt overlay, unless there's any more questions about asphalt overlays. We'll go right down to the next, we'll go right down to the next category outside of asphalt overlay, I think. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Oh, go back. 
So Burstick Lake uh, Road grading base pave. Historically, um, we've used tax revenue to fund the grading um, as well as the preliminary engineering. And then we were using the paving restricted surplus for the actual paving. There again, in, in the issue um, or the, the interest of transparency and trying to really paint the picture better for council, the grading is very much associated with the creation of a base for paving. Um, that's why this project now is shown being fully funded from the paving restricted surplus. Again, um, like I say, the history was River Road, Lesseville East was paid for by uh, a grant, but I think even, you know, Timey Road, it's likely it was MSI. We've always just done a very, um, just a, a mix mash of funding strategies to get us through year to year, where this is one of the first times I think we've actually spent the time to actually look down in the future saying how this, what's the appropriate way that a base pay project should be funded from, from its inception till completion? Should it be a paving reserve um, or should the grading be done through tax revenue? Um, it's, it's been administratively driven as and maybe an option of convenience at the time, but uh, maybe even put it to this group there to see if that strategy stands true that it should be the paving reserve and funded accordingly. Deputy Reeve, Mel Huff. Thank you, Reeve. I, I would agree if we were always going to pave if we do base pave. But that's not necessarily the case, right? Like, we may not actually pave something that we've done a regrading and base pavement project for. Aren't we, if we set it up like that in perpetuity and we make a decision in the last year, for example, as a council, we're setting up the next council to have to pave that road if we are set it up that way, are we not? And I don't want to set up for future councils for decisions that I have made either. I want them to be able to make the decision that's right for them. I can certainly appreciate that. I, um, I the, the only reason I would say it for this one in particular is that it was, is that the it's being constructed to the base pave standard. Um, but then in my mind, I'm creating the picture up on and Beaver Flat Road. Actually, that one's actually being constructed to a base pave standard. So in the future, that it, we wouldn't have to reconstruct it again. So um, I can certainly appreciate the perspective. And I guess I look back to finance there to to speak to that. You know, could we even just earmark these or check these as that, you know, preliminary engineering grading would be funded through tax revenue and only paving would be funded through the paving reserve. We set that as a, as a general rule. Yeah, I would, I would um, have to put some thought into that. We could change the restricted surplus to be um, base pave and paving instead of just paving and then it would encompass both. I hate to have it funded through tax revenue um, just because it's not like something we do every year, right? And that's where I, those for sure, I would like funded through restricted surplus so that we're seeing that we're saving for something and the money's coming out. I mean, Beaver Flats is a perfect example because it's not on the payment list and it's being done to a base pave. And it's, it's not still, being paved. So. Yes, but it's still a base pave yes, project. Yes, but it's not being yeah. paved. Councillor Graham. I personally really like the model that's been used with the Ochis Road, where the road's chosen and you save for that particular road, then, you know, we've had the money sitting there waiting for partners, but I would personally like to see more projects done like that, where when the money is saved, that's when we move forward. And I understand things come up here and there and you can adjust and obviously councils change, but I would love to see roads done in that manner. Okay. Thank you. So perhaps we could start with the fundamental question that is Burnstick Lake Road that this this council didn't set that as a priority. Is that still a priority for paving Burnstick Lake Road? So on this project, this is extending that that last three miles or five kilometers or whatever it is. Yeah, it's extending it um, from the end of the pavement to the Burnstick Lake campground, and then there's still another 11 kilometers down to the to the James River Bridge, like it's, and that's that's the expensive piece. It's longer. It's more work to be done. Um, still, from the traffic patterns we're seeing, we're still seeing more northern utilization than it is from the south. There's definitely people that do come in from the south, um, but then just from a um, 
I even remind um, you, Daryl, there, there was a time actually we had uh, Burnstick Lake Campground offered to $350,000 in MSI of their MSI money to assist in um, paying for a portion. Now that was 2018. Uh, that may be an opportunity again. It was at that, that request was brought to the previous council and um, they, it was just maintained. They didn't expedite the construction schedule. It was on the list as 2026 and it stayed there. So they thanked the Bernstick uh, Village for, for the offer and it was, a, it was a partnership. It was better than nothing, but it wasn't enough to sway the, the schedule. Um, Councillor Swanson? Maybe that deserves a, a reach out to ask where they stand and if they're still interested and then bring that back to Council for the 2024 del deliberation at that point. Um, I guess I look at towards the area councillor. Is that still a priority that you've heard through the campaign? And if not, could we push it a year or two down the road? Councillor Cermak. I have not heard of any. Big uh, thing on it. it would be really nice to have it paid. And so I would like to see it left at the years that it is on and see if we can get some grants. Not seeing any other uh, comments or feedback. So. Okay. So we can move on then. Um, sorry, uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Money who operates that campground at the end of this road? This would be kind of a recreation road. Mr. Burnstick. Yep. Mr. Martinson. So the Burnstick campground is owned by the government of Alberta, leased by the county, and we contract the Chamber of Commerce in Caroline to operate it on our behalf. They, um, as part of the agreement, they received the revenue from the campground, um, though they um, invest in uh, capital improvements to the campground alongside the county. So would there be granting opportunities there? For us to receive money or us to give money? To receive we continually look for grants to operate campgrounds. They're very much non-existent. Um, we received a municipal recreation grant for operations of campgrounds up until the mid 2000s. It's common for the, the province to sort of download onto you, which is how we received these leases. And then they're very open to provide funding for a short period of time after they've downloaded. And uh, so we received grants to operate the campgrounds that the province no longer wanted to, but the county was willing to operate. Those grants dried up in the mid 2000s and now we're operating these campgrounds with our own revenue sources. Okay, I was thinking of, of grants for paving, improving that road. That would be up to Eric, yeah. Yeah, there's been, it wouldn't fall under a resource road grant, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, uh, paving grants are, are very few and far between. Actually, some of uh, the STIP's um, uh, grant application criteria was that it, it didn't, wouldn't pay for paving. It's just a higher level of service that they weren't willing to, to afford. So that's why, you know, MSI has been earmarked as being one of the primary funding sources there because it doesn't come with the strings attached but because of the nature of the contracts, um, that it's easy to like, say, draw a box around, submit it as part of the application, and it, and it ticks all the boxes. And I, I might just say that the uh, new funding source, the funding formula has a component that uh, really recognizes uh, revenues from the oil and gas industry. So when we have a busy economy, we may see more money coming our way. Um, so if we anticipate that um, the economy is doing well, we can probably uh, understand <coughs> we might be able to source more revenue from the MSI or its, uh, its uh, uh, successor. Now, Deputy Reed Milhoff, please. 
Thank you, Eve. Um, aside from campground usage, how many other residents or industry or anything is along this? Or are we anticipating three months out of year this being utilized and the rest of the year not? There again, um, on the priority list um, from the previous council, we haven't been monitoring heavily um, traffic volumes. You know, we know we know that one of the major driving forces was the campground usage and the summer village. That was uh, one of the, the primary reasons why this project was, was put on the priority list. If there's additional information that council wants us to come back with in support of um, residents or there's no residents along that, it's all green space there, but even industrial use, um, something we can come back with. But. I'd just say that my understanding of that traffic on that road is, is a lot of recreational based use, but very heavily used when that's coming in. It comes off the end of a paved stretch of highway without a destination at the end of that pavement. It's, it's not an end point, it's kind of a midpoint. And the, the concept was that you would continue that through to one of the larger end points as opposed to just stopping for no particular reason at that point. So that's helpful at all. So when we get into bridges there, um, through the transition from Public Works offer Operations and Infrastructure, so bridges historically was looked after by Kurt and his team. Um, subsequently, uh, our focus this year, of course, has been getting off the 2023 years. Um, so, and then we will be working more diligently on the 2024 plan and beyond, you know, um, Mr. Ann already identified the need for us to, to go into, well, that was in, in gravel, but, but bridges as well. For, I need to increase my familiarity other than that historically, you know, a $6 million investment into our bridge infrastructure has been the investment needed. And we look for every grant opportunity every year to ensure that, um, that we can reduce that burden off, off the, whether it be the restricted surplus or tax revenue in order to um, try to still maintain our bridges Every year they change, you know, through through usage, um, uh, the their five year life cycle on the on the BIM inspections come back with it's it's incredible actually how much can change in a five year period when you get that new inspection report back, um, and then there's uh, funding criteria that's associated with that with that inspection. So some of them we're having to wait until those inspections are done, then we can identify it and actually apply it to a to a uh, to a project. Um, then of course there's always the fish passage there, which is been new. It was uh, basically a provincial priority saying we'd much rather, we'll pay for it, you fix it type. Um, right? And unfortunately, it just it increases the workload, but it's still um, on our staff to administer these projects. It is paid for the, by the province. Ultimately, it enhances our it enhances our infrastructure, but it's in for the fish infrastructure. Really, the, the road is likely still good. And it wasn't a priority, but it was there again. It's a way to get these environmental uh, deficiencies addressed, which is, which is also important. Um, maybe if I get uh, Kurt to speak anything else to the 10-year the plan, which we've outlined from Bridges. There again, it's been a combination of STIP, which we haven't identified specifically in, this, in the document. It would be from restricted surplus with every effort made to apply for, for that funding. But apparently, it's too unpredictable to, to really even um, to map out and so the 2024 year has been identified and then just a flat rate six million dollar investment to deal with our infrastructure deficit over the next 10 years okay. any questions related to bridges um, deputy reed melhoff sorry uh thank you um my understanding was page 50 was like a combination of everything but it's showing us five million but the only bridge i can find is the um, BRB008, and that's, you know, 1,065,000, and this is showing 2024 as 5 million. So is this just to put into that to fund future projects, as you're saying, or is this not a breakdown of all the jobs in that year because the numbers don't match? Well, you haven't, page. unfortunately, we haven't had, from the time that we were preparing this, this is a, a great discussion for uh, restricted surplus. It's not the budgeting document. So it's going to be very much draft. We haven't had time to even build the plan here for our even our 2024 year bridge plan. Um, so if there's an error in the in the funding for the uh, restricted surplus, 
it should be all of 2024 be identified from restricted surplus. Okay. Well, sorry, maybe I'm not being clear. So the bridge BRB008, um, like that's a specific bridge, a specific project, 1,065,000. But then the next page, like B016, 5 million, and then 6 million, 6 million, 6 million, 6, but it, nothing, like I don't quite understand how the next, because it just seems like bridge is random and it doesn't specify anything in particular. Oh. Or am I reading it wrong? Oh. I, w I would have a perspective on that, but it could be totally wrong, so I'd let administration um, share what the thought is there. And I would defer to Mr. as he created the budget for this, for this item there. Perhaps he can provide some more insight than I. Mr. Magnus. Yeah, please. so come budget deliberations, as we saw for 2023, you'll have the breakdown for the bridges that, are, that we anticipate completing for 2023. Um, it's an ongoing assessment yearly. So as Mr. Hansen pointed out here, the uh, right now our capital project supervisor, she is uh, attaining the data in regards to the inspections that have been completed. We get yearly inspections from any number of our bridges. And at that time, we're able to determine um, in more specific cases as to the ones that need to be rehabbed. So it's an ongoing yearly thing. Typically, we only have about, about two years projected. But what we've found over the years is anywhere from five to six million is a general number, a safe number to base our budgeting on. Um, it's usually, like I said, typically four, five, maybe six bridges. And we've found over the last 10 years that seems to be a, a really good number in, in regards to helping us to budget. So what you're seeing there is, is historically what we're seeing for numbers or with regards to any type of uh, bridge rehabs. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. In history, it would actually show that we actually, the bridge deficit was at 10 million at one time, and which I think has been completely depleted. Um, so again, so identifying these, like I say, a, a funding source, a long range funding source pattern is important because that was um, I believe if it's not depleted completely now, it will be as, as projected to be. So, so any more? It, maybe if I could, because the word, the term bridge deficit has, deficit has been used several times. But my understanding is, if all our bridges were brand new, <laughs> uh, they would be you know, we would have no deficit since our bridges are are depreciating or deteriorating kind of at a known or an unknown rate. Uh, that's how Mr. Magnus was eloquently saying that it's, they're assessed so we know where we're at more. Um, a deficit would really would be that to bring them back to brand new, that's the amount of money would have to be in, in, injected into the, the system. Is that is that a fair way to look at it or is there a better way? No, it's, it is fair and, and I'm I guess I may have rolled that out a little bit too, and, and and we should be sensitive to that term because it is a, because that's not a reality of getting them to be new. Really, this is the investment in order to maintain our bridges. So, um, you know, it's one thing to say about if we want to build ban-free roads and have a good road infrastructure, and then coming up to a restricted bridge, um, or having to restrict a bridge there completely negates the the usefulness of a ban-free road. Thank you. So if we can skip right past bridges. Agrec facility, uh, we've had some extensive conversations on this project. Um, even, you know, looking at the $12 million mark in that 2028 um, year seems still appropriate for, for the amenities that have been identified. We did identify there was a motion that's in place there to supporting a $500,000 investment um, with no end date. Unfortunately, we, we do not have $12 million in that account by 2028 or the subsequent $10 million by 2029. So 
there's going to be, there's different funding sources that could be used, um, but that has definitely been identified as a funding shortfall in order to, to meet that project deadline. Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Have we done or can we do some vig visioning on, like, because previous council discussed an ag rec facility, previous council discussed an administration building. Can we do some, like a workshop maybe, where we can do some strategic visioning as a council of what it could look like to combine those two projects and get the most efficiency we can find um, for the benefit of our administration and our residents? Maybe I'll speak to him. Ms. Sirhan, please. Yeah, um, so I guess we want to make sure that um, when we do that visioning uh, that we are close to building because if we vision now and the project actually doesn't move forward for six years, it's a different council. In fact, it's two councils. So um, if what we want to do today is make sure that these facilities are where you think they need to be and and are they going to be funded through restricted surplus? You want them totally funded before you start? Or there's a, maybe a, a possibility of uh, debt to fund these um, facilities. If debt's off the table, then what year do you want them to be funded by? And then we will calculate how much a year you have to away. Okay, I'm sorry. I think that that's why we need the visioning because personally, I'd like to see those two buildings put together under one, under one roof for the efficiency of the community. So, and there's a much bigger pool for the administrative building than this building and they would be completely different looking restricted surpluses if we were putting those buildings under one roof or one plan than doing them two separate, than doing two separate programs and two separate plans. That's why I'm, I think that we need to do a strategic vision of what, that act, what this actually looks like. Can we accomplish this independently? Should we accomplish this independently? Or should we be thinking more of a combined efficient building of administration and ag rec? I think a little Mr. bit Martinson. of what you're talking about is planned for this year in a sense of, I'm not sure council's the best group to establish the amenities necessary to meet the needs of our community for ag rec. Uh, tons of experience around the table um, in, in 4-H and cattle showing and things like that. Um, but um, when we built the original plan that's now dated, um, it was uh, hundreds of folks um, consulted um, through various methods. So we, are, we do have plans for the ag rec um, building this summer to go back into some of that work that we've done and check with the community to make sure, you know, do we need 20 wash stalls still if, if we want to put on these events? Yes. We still want to put on these events? Yes. Okay. So we need 20 wash stalls. Do we still need a campground? All those things just re-establishing. Once we have that list of amenities, if council wishes to put them under one big tent in the future, it's just a matter of going to a designer and saying, here's the amenities we need in a facility. So I think, you know, we're ready from the ag rec perspective. Um, when that discussion happens, I don't know if, if um, you know, uh, we're, where we would be and Eric can speak to, to having, you know, the needs fleshed out for a new building. That's been done in the past too. So um, I think, you know, from the ag rec perspective goes, we want to be in a position so that, um, we can do those uh, exercises as, as uh, finance manager Sirhan mentioned um, in a timely, appropriate manner and have the, the information ready. So that, that will be our, our uh, intent. Thank you. Additional questions? Um, uh, Tracy, I'd look to see is, uh, is, okay. So I think it might, since I don't think we can get through your entire presentation here without a break, I think we will uh, break uh, now for a recess and we'll be back at uh, 12.45.
Welcome back, everyone. We uh, continue through our agenda of the day, and I'll go back to uh, Mr. Hansen where we left off, please. Just uh, maybe oh, sorry, clarify Mr. one point. Um, do you have the, is that the, what I said? Yeah. Okay. So I think the facility discussion is exactly what we need to have. So I'm just bringing up the um, facility expenditure and revenue summary. So it shows the facilities that are currently um, in the projected 10 year plan. And the first thing that um, administration needs is, okay, so is 2028 when we, is that still where we want that project to be? It's half of the Agrec facility and the entire administration building. In 2018, um, the, that council made the decision to put one and a half million dollars away <clears throat> a year for 10 years, and that they would build a facility in 2028. So is that still where you see that facility going? Uh, as far as um, the the year and the agrec facility, is that where you see it going? If it isn't, then we would come back with updated numbers. Like if it's five years from then, it's going to be way more money, right? Or if it's sooner, then it's going to be a, possibly a bit less. So, and then we would calculate how much would be in the restricted surplus for um, that project and calculate how much we have to put away per year to get that project um, on the go. So yeah, this, this is the exact discussion or the priority setting that we would like to see happen. Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I think that it would be poignant of us to gather as much information as we can. Um, i.e. why do we need a new building? We've been killing ants, for example, all morning, just as one example. Um, we uh, have a significant, significant contribution to the municipality in which our buildings are housed in, in, since they're not in our own municipality. I think that needs to factor in, and I think we need to roll that out to the community and, help, and they can help us decide what they would like to see um, and when. Do, would they like to see us continue to pay $475,000 a year just for the rights of having our buildings within this municipality? Or would they like us to have our buildings within our own municipality and potentially sooner, et cetera? I think if we gather all of the pros and cons and roll it out to the community in a town hall fashion, that may be appropriate. Along with things like we're killing ants and our HVAC is this and the efficiencies that could be found in doing it in another way. We're in for five different buildings, et cetera. That's my thought. Thank you. Any additional thoughts or comments? Um, oh, Councillor Graham, please. I personally, going back to kind of how I'd like to see the road paving being done, I'd like to make sure that we align our priorities so we're really putting a lot of money into saving for these buildings so it's not you know, a $52 million hit in 2028 because that's not feasible. So I think if we're, <clears throat> I'd love to see them happen in 2028, but we need to make sure we set ourselves up for them to happen if that's what we want. I think it's always important to align those funding sources so that we're, we're not taking a $52 million <laughs> hit to the <laughs> tax revenue source at that year. We, we, that was, wouldn't be, be practical. So we definitely would have to, have to ensure that we had a, a good funding stream. And I mean, that's been part of what the exercise here is, is really looking at our asset management plan and how we, uh, how we moderate the effects of year-to-year -year shifts in need and, uh, and the ability that <coughs> our revenues are somewhat consistent and that our, our expenditures can vary from year to year. So we're finding ways to level and average that. So. Um, Please go ahead, Mr. Hans. <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I'm going to build off of uh, the conversation that uh, Ms. Rand just started there. You know, if we're talking about the building. Um, you know, it's a good idea to, like, 
If you're going to relaunch um, the idea of a new building into the community, um, you know, a couple of years out would be a good idea, and I think we would uh, actually budget accordingly. You know, if we want to have a scientific method that we want to present to the community on, you know, um, benefits, pros, cons, and um, uh, facility index, proving out um, what our life cycle is for these buildings and the, and the other ones, um, there is some... Some things the science are not going to tell us. Like if we leave it to the scientists, they can, you know, you want them to pick out the, the appropriate location. Or is there something that, you know, this council would be prepared to say that, you know, the location up in the north is the is the location that the new building is going to be, and we're just waiting for the funding and the, the communication strategy, or is that a, is that priority need to be revisited as well? And to what extent? Um, like I said. In order to create this this scientific analysis, there we just need the resources to do it, and then and then to know when you want it done by. If it's something that you want done in, I'm going to say not 2023, please. Um, it's not, no, I'm not looking for any additional uh, major projects for this year. Well, um, no, no, <laughs> please, please. No, um, yeah. You know, if we want to, you know, start building that into the plan, as they, you know, they they say that planning study needs to be done and a siting analysis and the. Um, facility index, all those types of things to be brought back, as well as the community engagement. You know, you guys are IDPs, amalgamation, MDPs. Like, it's a big, heavy year this year. And but we certainly, we, if we get a better plan on what if you'd like to see that done in the next two years, if you want to see that done in 2024, and to what extent? Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Uh, personally, I would be great with us looking at, at um, rolling out a community engagement strategy in 2024 for us to see what their thoughts on what this could look like. I want them involved right from the front end, right from the beginning. I don't want us to come at it later, right from square one. I mean, for us, it's not square one for previous councils, but for us, this is square one. And I want it them involved right from the beginning. So just a, a recap of the numbers then. So the admin facility is set at $40 million and the AGREC facility phase one at 12. Um, there would be uh, a shortfall in 2028 of $17 million. Um. Deputy Reeve Milhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. So I know how we got to the 12 for egg. Um, we've seen the feasibility studies for that. There's, I, I want to say it was 40 pages, but I could be wrong. Like, it's quite extensive document. I have never seen anything for the administration building. I have no idea how we got to 40. Um, I, I can understand why it's like it's a very extensive building, but I've never seen anything to to justify why that number as a placeholder at 40 million. I, Never seen anything, unless you guys have. I've never seen anything. I, I can comment about that, but I'll go to uh, Councillor Graham. Um, Deputy Reeve Malhoff, you suggested 2024 to start off. My concern with 2024 is 2025 is an election. So then we're going to start off kind of like with the MDP, how we were thrown in after rounds of people being involved are. And it, if we do in 2026, then it's still the two years before. So I should. I wanted to throw that out there, just a thought. And I think, um, if I can just comment, I, I mean, having been involved uh, when the uh, last administration complex or county office was considered, I think the numbers were up to about 28 million at that time, but I would assume that this is seven or eight or 10 years down the road, I guess, that we probably just assuming that there would be at least that much uh, additional cost to do the same thing. So, so the best time to have done something would have been many years ago. <laughs> the next best time is sometime in the near future. So that's why we would need to talk about the costs and be understand what's the pros and cons there and then uh, try to engage the public in, in some basics, I think, around. We can't just, I don't think we can go out to the public without having some basic um, you know, important things to build on, because uh, if you went out, you would probably get twelve thousand different opinions of what the best uh, best choices for the future would be. 
and very few of those would involve a forty thousand or forty million dollar um, administration bill. But, anyways, any additional comments? Oh, Councillor Cermak, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I would like to see this rec and the um, administration building, like Jenny had said, together. And I would like to see it close to where there's the divided highway when it gets there. I think east, southeast of uh, Rocky, somewhere. Um, there's lots of land out there, I think. Uh, I'd love to see it together. And I think that's something that we need to get together and uh, maybe get a plan and say what we need and how we'd like to see it. And then go ahead. And then go ahead with uh, out to the public and say this is what we propose and the cost and get it done by 2028 or 2029. Thanks. Councillor Radcliffe? I think the CAO was first, but oh, um, anyway, I, I have similar thoughts and I think it's worthy of a workshop to get some more attention on it. And Mr. Ammons. Thank you, Reva I was actually gonna use this just as a case in point um, to help um, with an example of Deputy Reeve Melhaf's comments prior. Um, some of the decisions every council makes does commit future councils um, no different than your paving. Um, that when a council makes a decision to pave an additional road, that's a future commitment for every councillor because I don't know if any of you have been fortunate enough to take a paved, paved road and turn it back to gravel because the resources are no longer there. It's never well received with the community. Um, this building, um, I absolutely um, wholeheartedly support and agree with the need to involve the community um, because there's so much around it. Um, not only the commitment um, when it was planned to bump it up 10 years um, that, was, that was given by the council of the day, but also the inefficiencies we see and to educate the public in that of having parts of departments under different roofs and how that negatively affects the service. Um, and I also uh, agree with Councillor Cermak as far as a workshop that um, as this comes closer, planning for that. Um, you know, Council of the day uh, may say exactly that, that it's best positioned to the east. Um, you know, but there's gonna be some operational constraints now because again, this council and even future council is handcuffed by past decisions. And a council in the past purchased a quarter section to the north where we have some of our operations already established and investments already been made, which will create um, a challenge for future councils. So part of all of that coming forward and then where to allocate um, money for those priorities. Um, but I just thought this, this whole conversation is a great example um, for this strategic workshop on allocating the reserves and and honestly the commitment it does put forward to future councils. Um, I really appreciate Deputy Melhaf's comments because as much as possible, we never want to do that to a future council, it's not fair. And to always remember that I think is very prudent, you know, but, but some of these decisions have no choice um, because you can't stop everything every four years. And there just needs to be some, some consistency. And, and for us, um, we hope that there's enough logistic support. And with these reserves, it shows a good solid plan that even a new council will say, you know what, it, it makes sense. And it minimizes the risk in going forward. And Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Is there an opportunity, or has there already been done a feasibility study on the administration building that's already been accomplished? Sorry, I just see a nod over here. So, um, yep, yeah, actually, we had a. Uh, that's actually when the decision was made to defer the project for ten years, as well as the the recommendations that came out of that feasibility study were to 
you know, set up a savings plan, uh, reinvest into our existing infrastructure, um, like I say, with the intent of uh, combining, um, and so, it, so they're basically invest in our existing infrastructure, supplement with um, additional, so that was when we purchased the, the, the new public works building there, that was for the action items that came out of there, as well as setting up the savings plan, which we started putting uh, $1.5 million um, a year away in, um, and then the third part of that plan was to eventually construct the new, uh, a new facility. Um, so yes, we do have that feasibility study um, that was presented to council back in 2018. Uh, we can certainly uh, forward that information. It's dated now because that's been a while ago, but I mean, that information is available. Supplementary? Please. Is there an opportunity then to update that feasibility study and get it ready for a town, for town hall or community um, engagement session 2025, post-election? Oh. Timeline definitely would support that if that's, where, if that's what you'd set up for a timeline. Because we have to then plan for the 2024 budget for an upgrade to the feasibility study, right? Yeah, I've, that was to be, yes, we would want to make sure that we budget something for to upgrade that, uh, that study, but definitely, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, not seeing any additional comments or questions. Okay. Moving on. Um, Caroline commercial lot development. Um, some of you probably seen the, the concept drawing. I did actually email that out for the benefit of uh, the council members there. It was the, the draft area structure plan. Um, I know the final area structure plan is very similar, so I wasn't as confident in sending out the draft. Um, but it shows the, the 10 industrial lots, which we currently have, which we rented out over the past couple of years out to TC Energy, which is great. We have our, our own lot there off the north end. Um, this budget here would, um, is reflective of the development of those 10 highway commercial lots. Um, now, that, this particular, particular project has been basically bumped year after year um, just in regards to the, the evaluation of um, Caroline's sanitary and water infrastructure. Looks like it needs some support before a development of this size um, could move forward. Um, the discussion about amalgamation, um, we've always left it in the budget as a placeholder, not a concrete date of when it was going to be done. We've used that term a few times there as, as a placeholder. Realistically, it likely shouldn't be on the, the, in the 10-year capital plan, but we've always left it in there as a representation of what our plans, our future plans are for, for Caroline. Um, I would, when it comes to the 2024 budget, I would still recommend even bumping that farther down the line because these those, is that the highest priority in Caroline um, when and if the amalgamation were to take place? Is that still the, the largest priority compared to what other priorities might be set? Um, very, there again, infrastructure, infrastructure upgrades, maybe that needs to be well done before we consider a uh, commercial lot development. Um, but that's how we did set up a, a public works capital, which has been um, identified as the restricted surplus to fund this project. Uh, but that could certainly be either reallocated or when we're ready to do this project, then that restricted surplus could be used. Um, so there again, I would probably recommend that we would even move the preliminary engineering out of 2024 and that would go to 2025 if we want to leave it as a placeholder or we just park the idea, remove it from the capital plan until we have um, the details of the amalgamation study and a infrastructure plan to deal with any deficiencies that we have down there. Any thoughts on this one? <laughs> Councillor Sir Mack, please. I would like to move it back maybe a year. Um, we're going to be having a amalgamation meeting here on Friday with the, with Caroline. <clears throat> maybe some things will come to light then. Um, I understand today, I did, was not aware of this, that we own 112 acres in that area there. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, so how much road building would we have to do to 
get this all going again and, and being able to sell these 10 lots that are against Highway 54 that is in front of the 10 lots where the salt building is way at the back end in our, our building there to store some snow plows. Is there quite a bit of, of building and road building we have to do in there to develop that land? The, the worst part about that project is the road. easy part. It's, a, it's the sanitary and water system upgrades in order to, because this would be actually, it's an urban uh, cross section through there, um, meaning that they're fully serviced lots with water and sewer, um, curb and gutter uh, road design, I believe. Um, now it's what's always been the hang up is, they say the support infrastructure from the village itself between the water treatment plant and the sanitary system um, would likely need to be upgraded first. So that those upgrades are not reflected and that would be the capital cost just to build the infrastructure, but I would hate to see it constructed and not be able to turn it on or, or sell the lots because they're not supported through those municipal services. Um, and this has been an ongoing conversation year after year um, with the amalgamation conversation looming that it was going to be wait until the amalgamation was completed, evaluate the, the priorities and then move forward with possibly this. Yeah, I would like to see it move back one year until the amalgamation has been concluded. We have a lot of money already tied in out there. So the sooner we can get at it, the sooner that we're, we're going to recoup our money back. And it's going to grow the southeast corner of our county, which will bring people in and increase our tax revenue and everything like that. So I would like to leave it in, but maybe push it back one year until we know what infrastructure we need to do in Caroline. And, and that'll all come with the amalgamation if, if it goes ahead or if it doesn't. Thank you. Councillor Radcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. If we are currently marketing those lots, are we getting much, many inquiries? No. No. So we are marketing them, but we're not getting much for a response. So uh, the only ones that we have for sale that are currently being marketed are the industrial lots. So that would yes. be the 10 three-acre lots. Um, they've been on the market for not 10 years, um, but it's been a while, and the, our biggest customer has been TC Energy as the, as the pipe storage. Um, there was some rumors, I guess, that another individual was interested in a lot. Nothing's come to pass, um, and we, we still own them all. So we've had, I, I said, I'm trying to remember what year we did that, 2017? 20, 2016, 2017 is when they came online and haven't sold a lot yet. Okay. In, in that case, I uh, agree with Councillor Cermak. Thank you. Um, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I may be throwing a little wrench into your guys' thoughts here. Um, 2024 is where it's slotted for, I'm guessing the 100,000 is engineering. Engineering doesn't have a stale date, typically. They, it is, the, the drawings are good forever, and the price tag on those drawings may not be, but the the work itself is good. Um, I would see no reason to not continue with engineering so that as soon as we get the information back on the accepting services, except, like the sanitary water, et cetera, we can pull the pin on a build. So we can push back the build, perhaps, um, if we, are, as we're doing the engineering, learn all of those things going, hey, this is not going to be, but no, I don't think anybody's saying we're never going to do it. It's going to have to be done to get our investment out. So doing the engineering, I think, is, I don't see a reason not to do the engineering. We might have to push back the build a year, but I don't see a reason to not do the engineering. And we can use that to build off of um, the community's underground infrastructure anyway. I don't see a reason not to. Um, Councillor Councillor Northcott. Already, yeah, there's just discussions right now with the amalgamation and uh, just discussion with Caroline. Water County, but I think this just really goes to show the importance of a thorough infrastructure study to be completed within the village of Caroline. But I also, like, in my opinion, you'll, you'll never sell a lot there without having public sanitary and, and 
like you're, you're without having public services there for water and sanitary, you're never going to sell a lot. I mean, you just can't. So for, for me, it is a high level of priority to, to have those lot serviced, but just slightly prior to that, it's very important to have a thorough infrastructure study, study done. Um, so that's just my comment on it. My understanding, this work would incorporate putting underground services in place, just not being able to hook them up to the village's infrastructure. Is that correct? Or an unknown of whether they could be? So um, I guess my recommendation would be not to get too far ahead of that, that evaluation that needs to be done on Caroline's, you know, an updated evaluation. I'm not sure when the last one was dated. Um, a lot of this engineering could be, you know, using that data will help support, you know, yes, this would be project specific for, you know, the, the type of um, infrastructure required for each individual lot, you know, the final grading design, everything else, you know, typically that usually involves tender development, which we wouldn't want to create that um, until uh, we were in that position. Uh, I wouldn't like to go, I don't like to get into detailed design until we actually get really close. And we've I've kind of been bit a little bit with um, the Ochis Road, for example. You know, we've spent a significant amount of money on detailed design. Since then, we've had other utilities come into play. There is some um, uh, end of life onto some of the permitting required for some of the for some of the the projects. Even this one here, I believe, has a wetland off the uh, east end that would probably have to be a wetland compensation, which is likely included in that in that cost. Um, and that some of that permitting does have. Um, a lifespan, even the issuance of the, the stormwater management plan. Um, there again, it's, it has a date, and I wouldn't want to get too far ahead of that. And using some of the, you know, perhaps we could piggyback off, they like say, the major engineering assessment that's done by us on the, on Caroline's infrastructure. When and if that happens, we'd be able to maybe not duplicate or get too far ahead in one specific area. If we have a good basis to build off of, it'll give us better information to build these priorities. So I'm, as much as I'm, I am share your enthusiasm to, you know, once it's engineered, then we should be able to build in the following year. Um, I hate to see any of, the, any of that investment lost. Um, just one more question for me. When those original industrial lots in Caroline were built, were they, was the underground infrastructure put in place when they were built, or is that something that has to be dug up again to... Uh, put that in place. It's interesting. I've heard the same, uh, the, a different rendition of what the future was for those industrial lots. And through the area structure plan and with the, the way that it was applied for, because we actually had to get that area rezoned, and those were completely self-sufficient lots. There was never a requirement of a sanitary or a water system to go up into that area. It was provisional that if and when it, it could happen, that. We would. I think there was even a document that, that you have to hook onto it if it was to go up there. Um, so in the development plan, those were to be, you know, they're sized at three acres. They were supposed to be on their own systems. Okay. Um, but there is a, you know, before anybody builds is the best time to put it in. <laughs> but, I, um, you know, if that becomes the priority, it, it would definitely make it more marketable. If you, you know, if we actually did move forward with the commercial the 10 commercial lots at the, at the south end, you know, to run those, that, that line up there and actually have those other 10 lots serviced. It uh, provides higher value, more usability, uh, fire suppression, because you'd have, uh, you know, fire water right on site compared to build, building cisterns or something else and definitely make it more marketable. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions on the um, Caroline commercial lot? One more, at so, least. So where are we at? Like, are we pushing this a year then? Or are we leaving it? Like, we kind of didn't come up with what we're, what we're doing. Do we honestly think it's going to be that long for us to get the information back from Caroline? Like, we've asked for it for years now, the information on the infrastructure in Caroline. Do we really think it's going to be that long? Because we've, like I said, we've asked for it for years. So, and it's part of the amalgamation conversation. So... When is it coming? Because now our investment is tied up in this and we can't move forward with our investment until then. Mr. Emmons, please. 
Thank you. I'll do my best, Deputy Reeve Milhoff, to address that one. I do believe it uh, might come into an ICC conversation with two councils. Um, in all fairness, given the turnover of staff in Caroline, a lot of that history has been lost. I have reached out to the CAO of Caroline. Um, he provided me an engineering document um, that really doesn't give numbers. It doesn't um, do a lot, and it's very focused um, on one piece of infrastructure. So I, I don't believe uh, the tensions there to adequately provide. So it might just be a conversation that we partner and look at getting an assessment done to go through um, an educated process. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Northcott. Um, I guess, is there an opportunity? I know when we were up at RMA and we had that discussion with uh, Minister Schultz with uh, Municipal Affairs, is there an opportunity to, to be able to apply for any kind of grant funding to be able to get a, a detailed infrastructure uh, study completed within, like for the village of Caroline? Mr. Emmons. So there is granting opportunity for the second phase. Um, administration can always put the needs in there for further assessments and engineering documents. Um, yes, there's opportunity. Um, what our success would be uh, right now, the, the phase two is just the phase two of, this, of the exploration process. Um, so we could definitely explore and, and inquire about the engineering study component. Okay, yeah, because thank you very much. My, my thought is that if, if we're having this amalgamation or just, you know, amalgamation discussion, I don't know if there's, you know, if the municipality of Caroline would have the, you know, the amount of funds required to be able to complete the study. So it's, um, but that study to, to to be able to have an assessment on that infrastructure and see what the future cost would be to, to upgrade that is very important. Okay, um, I'll just uh, kind of state my view. I, I don't see a reason to not do the engineering work on this. We know that's the next logical step and having that sitting on the shelf ready to go, I think gives us, uh, gives us some flexibility for either this council or future councils. Um, to be able to um, go into it with the eyes wide open. It's a fairly small part of an overall $3 million project. It's uh, 3% or so. Um, so I'm always one to uh, have plans to move forward and work from plans. So for me, I don't see an issue with the uh, planning aspect or the engineering aspect of that going forward. Um, I can remain flexible whether it whether the actual project uh, gets done a bit depending on priorities and those things would be very much dependent on where the amalgamation or dissolution subject goes. So, uh, Councillor Cermak. Yes, yeah, that's exactly my point is we don't know where this amalgamation is going. If, uh, if for some reason uh, we don't go ahead with the amalgamation, then this what we're looking at isn't going to benefit us. And sure, it's our land down there, but do we want to invest more money in the southeast down there and get no return on our money for the next 10 years? Or do we want to really push and get that going? I don't think that's being a good neighbor, uh, pushing a neighbor into something when we're doing their studies. I I just would like to be a good neighbor and if they agree with it, then that's fine. If they want to pick up half the cost, I think that's fine too. Then we could go ahead. But I don't think I want to put the county in that position that they pay for the whole bill if the amalgamation doesn't go ahead. Just, just so you're clear, what I was saying was that to go ahead with the engineering work for the development of the uh, commercial lots, not the engineering work to assess their um, wastewater facility. I, I certainly wouldn't want to. Uh, I've, we've had the assurances that that's uh, got a thumbs up from the Alberta environment as it moves forward, but I, I think anything around an amalgamation would, would probably need to have greater detail. My, my real thing was to give the go-ahead for the engineering work around this potential commercial lot development and have that 
on the shelf ready to go to um, support a project, to support one of our other projects, to support one of our other communities. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just if, if that's, that's, where I, that's where I was going with that. Um, yeah. I'm looking, Sorry, I'm, I'm okay. seeing Councillor Graham. Thank you from across the room. I personally would like to, to push it all for a year. I worry as well if, however amalgamation proceeds, if we are not able to hook up because the system cannot take it. I know we've been assured it can, but when they can't provide us with the, the paperwork and everything to, to prove that, um, I would like to be a 100% sure, have the studies done and everything. I would hate to spend this $100,000 and then we have to change everything and then we have to redo our study because we had to change everything and then it's just $100,000 down the drain. So I would like to push the whole thing for a year personally. Okay. And I'll go to Councillor Northcott and then the Deputy Reeve and then, and then to Councillor Swanson. All right. Well, I don't know if it would be that pushing another municipality or anything like that but I think definitely assisting would be would be absolutely just in my opinion but I think it would be welcome again the discussion is amalgamation or dissolution possibly or whatever the discussion is so it just goes to show that there's not a uh, you know huge financials uh, in that community that the finances are you know aren't strong for having these discussions right so but to have better services like it, you know, to be able to move forward with this, whether it's like to, to be able to have a detailed uh, study, like infra, in, infra, uh, infrastructure um, study completed so that we know actually what is uh, deteriorated for the infrastructure in, in, within the village of Carolines, what upgrades would need to be done, but then to be able to move forward to be able to offer better services for the rural residents of Clearwater County and the southern portion of the county. So rather than just sitting, you know, pushing and pushing and pushing, it. There's that conversation, like that infrastructure study that they talked about the, when we were at Edmonton is very important to, to be able to complete that so that we, you would even know what size of piping to be able to tie it in or, so anyways. And uh, Deputy reeve -Bell Hall? No, I, I absolutely agree, uh, agree that the uh, Caroline needs to be able to provide that or we need to be able to partner with them to provide it or build it or whatever we need to do because I, we don't even at this point know if it, if it even exists or needs to be created right from scratch. Um, but I don't see the downside in building the engineered like drawings to sit on a sit on a shelf for future. At the end of the day, this facade, sorry, I keep pointing at my computer because I'm looking at the area structure plan. Um, but this, we can only market these and sell these and get our investment back out if they become wet um, versus dry. Um, sales opportunities and that's what I, I, I'm looking at this from the point of a developer because we're the developer here like we're not the municipality there we're the developer and as a developer our concern is the engineering on our hundred and how many oh, acres 112 yeah. acres that's what we need to worry about and therefore we need to do the engineering for our development if we were a random developer and not a municipality we would just go forward with the engineering, get it built as soon as possible, and get them for sale as soon as possible. We'd be looking at our out game, not all the other pieces that go with this. I understand those pieces are very important too, but if we're actually going to help the hamlet, because originally this was done in order to help the hamlet, correct? This would become a tax base for the hamlet, eventually. We can't sell Village. these properties unless they're Village. wet property. Village. 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 They're not a hamlet yet, sorry. <laughs> the village. And to help... The village. So in order to do that, we need to make these, and I think the engineering needs to be done, whether it's done next year, two years from now. The build doesn't have to happen right away if it can't, but the engineering needs to be there. And Councillor Swanson. Uh, great perspectives from everyone. I'm uh, in favor of pushing it out a year because a lot can happen in a year with our conversations with the village. The other thing too, in regards to a study, um, as uh, Eric has pointed out, it can be stale dated of some portions of it. So to me, it depends on our priorities. Is this the priority of this council to be doing this or do we have other priorities that really kind of rank a little bit higher? So to me, this is until we have further information in regards to our relationship with the village, I'm willing to push it out one year. Okay, so I think what I was hearing there is um, push it down the road, I think I heard the can kind of take a couple of bounces. 
in general? You'll be able to see this again during budget deliberations and actually even, you know, once we actually conclude the project exercise and we start looking at um, dollar deficiencies, you know, I, I'm also building in my mind right now, um, do we need to now fund the sanitary water line up into the industrial lots? Because that's not included in that cost. If that's, if that's a priority in order, as we discussed, more marketable, whatever, if that becomes a priority, that two point whatever goes up to three point whatever, four. Councillor Northcott. All right, well, <clears throat> in my opinion, it is high level of importance, but uh, it's not just for the residents of the village of Caroline. It is, there are lots of rural, thousands of rural Clearwater County residents in that area. So anyways, for, for my opinion, it's a high level of importance. But that infrastructure study within the village of Caroline is very important. Yeah. I hear you on that, but um, the engineering wouldn't have included that, would have it, that, that we were looking at here, so. Okay, um, so I just did want to point out that we did um, add additional funds to the, um, to the admin building there. It, historically, you would have seen that at 30 million. Um, we know that uh, cost of, construction for buildings, specifically material supplies, so that um, uh, Reeve Law is not wrong there. The original study showed around 28, so we rounded to 30. Um, it's safe to say by uh, 28 to get the same, the same product could easily be $10 million more. Um, that would need to be fleshed out. And this organization isn't the same as it was in 2018 as well. Like it's, um, we've grown already, um, and we knew that as, as one of the, the driving forces in 2017, 27, 2018, when we were coming with the recommendation is that the growth, the growth is here and the only good way to facilitate that growth is to go buy more buildings and expand out and renovate. And, you know, we renovated out into the shop there to support our IT staff. And um, anyway, so that's uh, the disposal of the assets. We've uh, recently discussed um, with the town, we'll likely only be able to dispose of two buildings um, this building here, we'd have to probably consider other options for a sale. There come, this building comes with um, some challenges environmentally with its previous historic usage. Uh, whereas, you know, the public works building where um, the, the old skyline building and the emergency services building likely be able to just be um, pretty much a clean bill of health sold off as in as is. But, you know, by assessment, that's only around $3 million, you know, maybe on the north side of that, I'd hope, but conservatively about $3 million for those two. Um, then whatever type of arrangement for this building here, um, so it does put us at a funding deficit, even if we were, you know, um, like Mr. Ann already alluded to how much underfunded we are, even at the 28 year, a 2028 plan. So that's definitely something we wanna, as we're going through the assessment, um, we need to identify how the, the, do we plan on borrowing the additional funny, money, money, <laughs> additional money to, to fund the shortfall? Is it going to be tax revenue? Is there another MSI grant? We want to allocate that year for that, but we definitely want to have the, close the whole picture um, with that because that, during the, uh, the public meeting that we had back there, um, the funding source was a, was a huge source of uh, angst for people that we didn't have the money in place there. We're using multiple reserves to fund it, and which uh, from some of the comments from the community, it wasn't a, a prudent approach. Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Thank you, Reeve. Um, I think that, again, this is going to be needed to come back in a workshop because I have a lot of questions that I don't necessarily think are appropriate for a meeting such as this. In particular, water sewer, wherever we go with that building, water and sewer follow, and therefore potential development follows. And I just, I know that this, it, with it being land labor legal, that's not a conversation currently, but I do have lots of questions surrounding it. So again, it speaks to, we need a workshop. Okay. Moving on. Sure, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. 
uh, Lesterville rec area. Um, so this is the paving of the access road. Uh, historically, I, I believe I identified it from the paving reserve. Really, the restricted surplus that I identified for this project would be through the municipal school um, reserve. We are seeing, you know, by the time we've we've tendered the construction of the, the baseball diamonds and the soccer pitch, um, the playground looks like financially uh, we're in really good shape this year, would likely be enough to what we allocated for this year would, would pay for um, the paving as well as for next year. So we'd, we'd save more than the 240 some odd thousand dollars that have been budgeted or 340 some odd thousand dollars that it was budgeted for. So um, financially, from a budget perspective, we're in really good shape to have that, that project completed underneath that one restricted surplus line uh, with probably some money left over. Um, yeah, there's really nothing else to add about the recreation area. Okay, don't see any questions. Okay. Gravel road rehab. Oh, uh, Councillor Graham, again. I would just like to recuse myself for this one, please. All right, thank you. All right, Councillor Cermak. Uh -huh. Pardon? It's only 2023, so it's not 2024. Project have, list? Yeah, it's describing the 2024. It hasn't, it hasn't been updated yet for 2024. Okay. This, through my through the annual budget cycle there, which we usually do in September, have all these lists are going to be updated. There right now, this one shows 2023, but the numbers, this is really just the exercise to show the annual investment and then the funding strategy. So this isn't, this isn't budget deliberations, and though those that information will be updated to include the 2024 uh, project list, you know, during budget deliberations later this year. I just thought I'd want to. No. So if, if I, I can... can interpret what's here is I see a fixed amount with a small increase for expected increases <laughs> as we move forward. Is that kind of a correct? It's 100% accurate. Um, this is one of the ones that we did discuss though at, from, with finance, you know, is this a project that should be, you know, taken out and actually paid for from a restricted surplus instead of using tax revenue, even though this is a one that's there again, historically the same approximate amount year after year. Um, you know, Rhonda can maybe speak to it again. This is this is the best example of either we set up a restricted surplus and the money's moved into there and then taken back out to fund this program annually, or do we leave it as a tax revenue funded program annually? And the advantages, disadvantages of both. Deputy, oh, actually, I'll go to Councillor Swanson first and then uh, Deputy Reed Mellon. Just for clarification, uh, Rhonda, if we had it as a restricted surplus, um, because that would fluctuate year to year, we, we then decide on the projects that Public Works would bring forward. So in the past, how we've held it at that anywhere between around that $5 million mark, maybe some years it might be three, some years it might be seven, and depending on where that restricted surplus, surplus would, would balance. Mr. Hand? Yeah, so I'll just, um, it, it wouldn't require additional funding because it's already funded through tax yeah. revenue. So it would just be um, an extra step as far as putting it into the restricted surplus and moving it out. So I don't anticipate any changes to um, the dollar amounts or the program in itself. It would just be showing the plan that this is the plan that we, that we have. Okay. If I could in that plan, I assume that there is no point in that, that you would have everything rehabilitated. It would be a continuous cycle. It's always going to be uh, of that much energy and effort put into gravel road rehab. Yes, and unfortunately, yes. We're, and we're seeing, you know, as you can see the rate of inflation that I've included there, we're actually doing less with less, like it, more, we're doing less with a little bit more. 
Right. Um, the rate increases that we've seen through our equipment rate schedules, our cost of our own um, supplies, you know, that, that money isn't going as far as it used to. Um, do I still feel that we're in a, a really good shape um, to be sustainable? Absolutely, yes, because we can tell through our, our spring conditions. Now, you know, we, we can talk about scientific method and, and all those types of analytics that we could invest into it, but it's kind of a, a lost investment in my mind when we can actually see their direct results is how much these roads change from year to year through that frost cycle and through, you know, as we set up our priority list that we're trying to make our roads to get them up to our, our road standard. And the ones that we're working on are either below standard or have um, weak spots that uh, continue with the maintenance heavy type roads. So um, it's a, there again, it's a healthy um, investment that's not, um, but it is, the money's definitely not going as far as, far as it used to. Okay. okay. Deputy Reeve Melha. Thank you, Reeve. Um, it looks like a most portion of this is from contracted services. So we do this with contractors, then I'm assuming. Um, how does that tender process or RFP process work? Because, for example, it's my understanding that there is a local contractor that works for other municipalities that does shoulder pill pulls and gravel recycling, like pulling it out of the ditches and putting it back onto roads, et cetera. They work for other municipalities, but not for our municipality. Do we send this out to RFP, like a tender process, anything so that those companies can bid on this stuff? Like, how does this work? So this is um, just about 100% day labor supplied um, through our hourly rates. So we have a, a contractor listing that we, we advertise every year that somebody provided, they provided uh, proof of registration insurance, WCB, they can get their equipment onto our contractor um, listing. Um, every year, this council for the last couple of years have approved the rates as for such. And so it's our staff that actually hire specifically off this contractor um, list to do this work on an hourly basis. And we then we're typically 99% sourced uh, locally from Clearwater County contractors. Okay. So those contractors could simply get a hold of you and figure out how they can either get on that list or That's correct. like is that on our website where they can show where they can apply to be on that list or just get a hold of you? Oh yeah, no, the the, the contractor community is well aware of, okay. of our this this program. It's it's been an annual program for for years through the day labor um, through, as a day, day labor account. Um, and there's there's value in it that we've seen our cost per kilometer there has been more than competitive compared to some of our tendered prices there for for grading you know it's um, it's a tight it's a tight group of individuals that we have for supervision as well as the rates are, are reflective to um, you know what we want we want you to stay local and compete in this our hourly market but we do hold them to task to say that this is our staff county dollars paying for for this road construction. So um, we get really good value from that program. Thank you. And maybe I could just add to that. We were in a meeting the other day uh, regarding trails building. Eric uses the same process uh, when he's building trails. The Rocky to Nordic Trail is a great example. And the uh, um, public lands guys we were talking to said that we can often get five times the value over their process of building. So um, doing the day labor versus the giant tender uh, um, has gotten five times the value in some comparable instances when building trails. So don't have those numbers for roads, but that was interesting to me to hear that they've compared to how we build versus how, how they're forced to build. Um, we have easier rules around sole sourcing, though we do have to follow, you know, the new West trade agreement. So sorry to, to horn into your show, but when you're talking value, that's what was bouncing around in my mind there. Thank you. Okay. Go again. Sorry, thank you. Um, so if this is working out extremely well, doing contract services and day labor, can we not replicate it in places like broadband? Hmm. Those are also five million plus dollars potentially. We can look at replicating it in local, with local contractors on things like, that you did on trails, you've done on roads. Why can't we do it on multiple other services? A lot of the difficulty lands a lot, specifically with broadband, is if it if it's grant funded, day labor doesn't work. They don't. They the process for reporting doesn't allow for 
for day labor contracts to typically as a, an acceptable practice for grant applications. There are too many holes in for the for the government to uh, to facilitate that. That's actually why you know to, in support of what Matt was just saying about it's easier for sometimes government agencies to funnel money toward us because even recognize the efficiencies that we can create, it doesn't fit in their reporting structure, which is a lot to do with there again with grants. Um, MSI even, for example, we don't, it doesn't fit, day labor programs don't fit well for MSI because of the reporting structure. It's much better to do a, and of course, we don't have any paving equipment and even any, there's not even a local paving company within the area. So it's better to actually contract that out, have a um, engineering, um, basically quantified, and that's what you get when you do a, a tender, is that everything's quantified, measured, and then um, basically uh, provide all that um, accounting or auditable information in a nice pretty package compared to day labor. So that's, that's probably what would be the restriction with as a broadband because of the amount of grants that they're trying to utilize. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay. Sure, I think we can probably bring the other uh, councillors back in. I think we're past the uh, gravel and all things gravel. So yeah, we've passed uh, grading projects because that uh, um, we're going to be completing the Beaver Flat Road this year. So we go right into, um, is this the first one in Nordic? There's mm -hmm. no 24 Nordic stuff, sequential. Um, yeah, so we've set out a capital plan for, for Nordic. I guess there's a couple ways we can do this. We either talk about each individual program or really the focus of this was a restricted surplus and funding discussion. We know that all of these, uh, the draft development plan of Nordic is funded through Nordic, the principle of Nordic pays for itself. Sales contribute back to how these projects are gonna be funded in the future. So unless there's something else specifically in Nordic we wanna talk about, um, like if you have other priorities outside of what we're seeing through the current plan. Um, so don't have to tell everybody here, we are working on that, that south access road uh, built to a gravel standard. Uh, it's all budgeted for this year, uh, has not gone to tender yet because we're still waiting for permitting. Um, so the idea would be any money that would be left over from this year would be carried forward in next year. Um, hopefully we can get our permits before next year. Um, then the Stewart Street um, improvement from cemetery up to uh, Elizabeth. We have the preliminary engineering for that to happen this year. Detailed design next year, and then uh, construction to follow. Um, finishing off the shallow utilities landscaping plan for the residential subdivision. Um, and of course, the paving that was all left over from last year. So like 2023 is an incredibly busy year in Nordic. Um, 2024 is quite a bit lighter. Um, but I know there was some discussion about the, the medium density uh, residential without the, the benefit of the mapping. I don't know. It's, it's almost another workshop in, in itself to get their, you know, the Nordic development plan, the, the overhead map, everything in front of everybody to have that proper discussion. Unless there's something that someone wants to bring up or I say it's all, it's all funded through the do to do from account. And the uh, paving for the access road was scheduled for 2028. 2028, if I remember, was a fairly big year if we follow through with. Yeah, we can certainly bump that. It was, you know, I think we wanted to identify paving as the, the long-term plan for this road. It, um, it'll likely, due to utilization, probably come higher to a priority list, but 2028 actually not that far anymore, right? So, True. Um, Time marches on. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you. I just wanted to um, be clear on this uh, South Access Road that uh, I thought the construction was to start on that in 23. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and then, then paving in 28. That's the plan. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Our, our biggest holdup for the South Access Road is our, is our federal and provincial permitting. So all of our detailed design um, is complete. Uh, we've done our consultation, our First Nations consultation, which that is not concluded yet. We've we've actually got some feedback from them. There's some some more concerns that need to be addressed with that. Um, our federal DFO permitting is is a very large one of our largest hangups, I guess, right now. And I believe public lands are going to reserve their decision making until they see the DFO approval. Um, now DFO can sometimes it goes well. It's very unpredictable to when they're um, they're they're proving nature. Sometimes it's up to a year, um, and it's already been in for six months. Um, hopefully, we just we kind of poke at them every now and then, but it it doesn't really doesn't really do a whole bunch of good to scream up sometimes. But with, we're at their mercy when it comes to the permitting. Are we at risk of missing the, this construction season? Possibly, for this year, yeah. Um, and that wouldn't be a horrible thing. There, there seems to be, in our discussion with public lands, there seemed to be some, even some public angst about the development of the road and bridge through that area. So, you know, we're not here to, to try to rush anything. It needs to be properly vetted through all the agencies and, and uh, everybody have their, their input. Um, it might even be a, a budget adjustment associated with it. So um, we want to make there, uh, there was discussion there even a public hearing in regards to the wetland application, which is, I've never heard of when it comes from the province. That'll be the first for us. Typically it's assessed. Um, we've paid the compensation that's required, um, but there is a, a mechanism actually for a public hearing for a wetland disturbance and which from what I understand public lands is looking to do. So, oh, okay. um, I said they've been hearing some concerns from the north, from the north subdivision. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that assessment. For sure. And uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, and then I'll go to Councillor Swanson. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, it's always confusing when I hear self access because my brain automatically goes to the egress access onto the trunk from the self that I've been talking about since the beginning. Um, and I'm curious if this one's getting so much. Um, discussions, um, I've heard negative about it right from day one, honestly, uh, but I understand its value, um, but perhaps we can have a better look at an actual self egress for that community because one way in, one way out, it's never a good idea. Not just UTV, ATV in the case of an emergency access because we've discussed that that is there, it has been utilized every five years the town site needs to be evacuated for some reason or another, so we have utilized it but making it a more permanent egress option, especially if this one is being held up. And I think the community would be much more pleased with that also. The wetland is a big concern for them. Okay. So I would, and I would put it back to the, to the group here. If, if, um, if that's something that's supported by council that you want us to um, have the research into into that south access, you know, we just have to allocate budget 2024 to, to um, get the feasibility study, you know, even to, there again, we have public lands, we have a private LOC um, to find a route through there. We need to have some um, survey data to support a, an application to the province. If, if, a, if a true south south access road is the, is the, uh, um, desire of this council as a whole, you know, we just need, uh, I can provide a budget number at during budget 2024 and we can um, exercise that next year. Um, I will, I'll go to uh, Councillor Swanson yeah. first and then I'll come back to you, yeah. Councillor Radcliffe. Oh, just and sorry, Miss, actually, Miss yeah. Sirhan has been waiting very patiently oh, for, for some time here, so. I was just going to, um, speak to the unrestricted surplus, specifically the Nordic development line there, which is in the second grouping, like general on the left-hand side in green. <clears throat> and then the second grouping is the land development and the first 
account there is the Nordic development. And you'll see the projected balance for the year end that we're just completing is a uh, million dollars owed back from that um, with $10 million worth of work happening in 2023. That also includes the um, natural gas project. So, um, and then from there on, it's just the projects that are outlined in um, Director Hansen's Nordic Development Plan. Um, plan. And uh, the only thing that we should or that needs some discussion probably, um, I mean, there's tons of things that need discussion, but um, one of the things is the things that go through this account is to be paid back through the sale of, of lots. So there might be some projects that that isn't appropriate for, like an access road perhaps would be something that, um, would be something you're servicing the uh, another hamlet with, or it's when you take a project that you're not developing land from and put it in the do to do from, there's no land to sell to recoup that money. So you have to depend on the lots that you have already developed or that are in the near future of being developed to recoup that money. So is there, uh, available funding within those lot sales um, to fund that, or is some of these projects have to be funded through the community purse? Thank you. And I'll go to Councillor Swanson, please. I uh, just want clarification on the job summary. So the Stewart Street Cemetery to Elizabeth, and going to 14 high density res residential, which is the west of Stewart Street by the Heritage Center. Um, are, you have 800,000 earmarked for 2029 for that Stewart Street high density residential. Are those, not, is that putting services in there in 2028 or 2029 as in possibility of 2025? Or I did, there's yeah. the same area, so I just yeah. want to know why you separated them. So um, this is the old uh, draft development plan. Now the okay. the Stewart Street to Cemetery section that's that's primarily road infrastructure. Um, that's not where the trunk line comes down. That's actually more of a spur that would go up and feed where the old staff housing was. Okay. The trunk line that actually needs to be upgraded actually comes down through Center Street down through the backside of this high density residential, then ties back into Stewart Street. Okay. So. Um, I know there was there was other discussions that were being had about this medium density, high density area, which also is home to these short term leases. Um, it's in the plan there. I say that's quite a ways down the line there at 29. Now, if that was to be expedited, um, it's a conversation that that was to happen sometime this year about revisiting the plan and the priorities based on what we see as demand. Um, I think another workshop for mm -hmm. Nordeg on that particular stuff to just help coordinate would be good. And Councillor Ratcliffe, and then I'll go to Councillor Graham. Going back to the uh, south access to the quarry, um, I expect that request came from the community to reduce the dust and traffic through the town site but I've also been hearing that, that they would like a south access from the south side of the town. So I would be in favor of um, an item for a study for that, you know, to come forward with some budget numbers. Okay, please. Is, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I, was, I was, I wasn't stuttering. I just, <laughs> is there a timeline, you know, as we, as we see the development of, you know, if you're going to look at all the other priorities that we have for Nordic, do you have a timeline? We can easily work backwards from when you would like the, the road to be completed to what work needs to be done prior to, but is it, is this in the, do you think it should be in the two year plan, three year plan, five or 10 year plan to when the South access that? 
the third access into Nordegg should be completed? Is there any thought process or is that something that, that we should come back with you with at our development threshold? I, I guess I'd like to see the cost of doing that to see where it fits in, uh, in our funding. But uh, two or three years from my perspective. And uh, Deputy Reed Melhoff. Uh, thank you. I actually would rather see that than the very contentious wetland road, uh, the road through the wetland. I would rather see the other access, even it's more of a priority for me than dismantling a wetland. Yeah, we're heavily invested into this, into the, that project we have right now. Um, but I can certainly appreciate your perspective. Mr. Emmons. Thank you, Eve And just maybe to wind it back a little bit for Council, what brought this access forward was dealing with the growth of Nordig. We have an existing quarry, and as Nordig grows, continually mixing those loaded trucks uh, with campers, with all the residents we've put in with the construction of the mobile homes, it was a matter of segregating the two opposing uh, traffic volumes and the type of traffic. So it was truly for that safety concern um, more than even um, the emergency access because to be blunt, it really, in my opinion, it wouldn't, and we have more qualified people around this table than me, uh, but for emergency services, it, I wouldn't even regard it as a secondary access because it's so close to the primary. Uh, if one's blocked, chances are that one is. Um, so I, I understand the conversation of an additional access for that emergency services, but this one truly was to accommodate development um, and, and separating out the types of traffic flow for safety reasons. So I just wanted to bring that to the forefront of uh, Council's consideration as well, why, why it was initially presented. And, and thank you for that, because that's exactly what stuck in my mind, that we have the, that... Um, centralized core there where we have the, the people enjoying the community often on foot or on a bicycle or something like that and mixing that with um, mixing that with heavy truck traffic um, I think it's nice to be able to keep a different alignment for that kind of use and, and I think the overall experience for everybody involved will be much better and ultimately safety of, of our community is a high priority so that's why I still support moving forward with that road. Um, any other comments? Thumbs up to move. Okay, we're going to peel out of uh, Nordig for now. Unless there's any other ones you can speed up, like for sale of lots like you did last time. <laughs> you were able to do it before? <laughs> I do. Have a Which phase can you see? Oh, so, uh, <laughs> Councillor Cermak's got a uh, a question for us. Um, the Nordic, the lot sales are supposed to cover all your expenses, right? That's a, that's a, that's a bold question. That's a bold Tentatively. <laughs> so this access road, I mean, this south one that, that uh, Councillor Melhoff would like to see go in, is that going to be in the equation <laughs> of when we sell our lots? How many lots have we got for sale this year? Or will have for sale this year? Yeah, and the quick math will tell you that there's no way that um, the new South Access Road that we're proposing to be constructed this year, as well as the other one, let's, let's add them together, $6 million added on to, you know, I know a lot of the, the capital that we're discussing with lot sales is associated with, you know, the earthworks, the sanitary, the capital costs directly associated with building those lots. The bigger conversation, of course, is increased public services, increased road access, higher level of service, paving of the internal roads. Um, that is not being accounted for as from a lot price perspective. We'll price ourselves right out of the, you'll never sell a lot. Um, so I think that's what Mr. Rand was actually alluding to at the beginning of the conversation mm -hmm. is that we have to you know, I think even the South Access Road for 2023 was being funded from the from the do to do from, whereas should that actually be like pulled out and be funded from a different source when we know that we can't have a uh, 
three and a half million dollar road there added on to the next phase or, or can we like should they be a million dollars a lot Nordic yeah I think so <laughs> so, so lot, lot price is going to increase you don't have to worry this about year sold signs because of you're telling us in all of the other stuff that we're doing is we're looking at 25 to 30 percent increase in work that you're you're looking at doing in the rest of our county shouldn't be any different out there so that's going to be the increase on the lots then yeah, I'll defer to Mr. Emmons there. He looks like he's eagerly he's, awaiting to, to chime in here. <laughs> Thank you. Go, go ahead, Mr. Emmons, please. Thank you. That uh, <laughs> might not be totally accurate. But, um, I just feel the need to help out poor, poor Eric as a colleague here. Um, in all fairness to him, uh, Brian, if I may, what we've always done is looked at Nordig as an entire plan. Um, within that entire plan is phases. Um, if, to give you a prime example, residential phase one, uh, when we finished the construction of that, the prices that went to council were the, was the price of construction. It actually donated the land. There was no money made there. It, it only reflected the cost of development. Yeah. And we sat on those lots for 12 years and then we sold out. Um, and actually there was so much angst, the previous council wanted to do a fire sale. Um, just to get rid of them. So giving you that explanation, what we do is average. Um, you know, the lots on the north side, I will say our profit margins were higher, which allowed us to save a nest egg because urban development is far more expensive than a rural design. So we look at the bigger picture. What we can't do is price beyond market. For sure. No. So saying that, um, like even, even council's decision with the gas line going out there, the natural gas, that was not in, in the plan. That was another 1.4 million um, that we're looking at recouping on the backs of the lot sales. But you can never exceed market or, or you're no longer selling. Um, I firmly believe, and I've always said, I believe there will be a reckoning at the end of this project. I don't believe in my heart of hearts that when we're done, it'll be zeroed. Um, so that will be a conversation. Um, I think administration's done amazingly well, keeping it where it is. And we look for all opportunities uh, for the phases that are more economic to construct. We still sell them, as per the Municipal Government Act, at marketable level, uh, which counterbalances. But there will be phases, uh, honestly, Councilor Cermak, that um, are tighter than others, mm -hmm. if, if that helps. Yeah. It, it's not just per phase. Yeah, I know. I see that the overall, I mean, when you put in sewer and water, you don't expect to get your return back on that. That's a service that the county su supplies. And I was just wondering, how the lots were going and if we have more for sale and what kind of increase were for the price of the lots. So on that, like I say, as the balance sheet shows, we're actually doing really well. Yeah. Um, what administration does uh, on behalf of council as uh, Ron has pointed out is the natural gas line, for example. When council approved that one, it was to encourage and promote the development of Nordic. Well, that was a trigger for administration. That automatically goes to that due to do from account because it's development driven. Um, there has been past decisions where it's basic infrastructure. Um, Public Works has gone out and ripped up sidewalks and repaired them. We do that in Lesseville. We do that in Condor. Um, that is no different. That has nothing to do with uh, the development of Nordeg, that's the sustaining of an existing community. So we, we actively monitor that. Um, I will say that given the development of Nordeg, some get hard uh, to actually say. Um, I always push for the do to, do from. Um, not, not there, uh, because like I said, I, I believe this project's gonna take a reckoning at the end, um, but to my surprise, um, it, it's going really, really well. So as, as the balance sheet does show.
But you're absolutely right, Councillor Cermak. The, the urban design, the water sewer, uh, directly impacts the cost of constructing. Um, but I will say it also impacts the marketability as yep. well. Those lots do go higher because they are serviced. So. Yeah, we proved that in Caroline. The lots there that aren't serviced, they said they, they've had lots of people call the town office, want lots, as soon as they tell them there's no water and sewer in it, they walk away. I've been told that all 10 of those lots could have been sold if they were serviced. So same out here. Thank you for the explanation. I appreciate it. And I'm going to go to Councillor Melhoff and then back to uh, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Reeve. I'm right. just going to dig a little bit deeper into Councillor Cermak's question. How many are for sale this spring? Or I guess rather restate the question. How many will be available for sale this year? Uh, Miss, Mr. Ammons is first at the light. <laughs> Again, I'm just uh, butting in. Um, at this time, honestly, I can't even answer that. Uh, planning's going through the process of surveying, titling, um, getting them registered. I'm, I'm not sure um, when that will fall through. So at this time, I, I wouldn't even hesitate to guess uh, if, if Eric can add, but I, for me, um, I just didn't want to put him on the spot. I don't have that information. So we have, uh, of course, we have tendered the, um, the shallow utility and the um, landscaping contracts for the phase two residential. Um, as soon as the frost breaks there, that, that work will be completed. It was a expedited completion date of, I believe, August 30th is when that work was going to be completed. And that then we hand the ball to planning to you know, whatever it takes to get those registered and, and actually be able to get that for sale sign up. Um, I believe there's still the conversation to be had about the commercial core um, and setting the prices on those lots. I don't believe this council's had that discussion yet. So so marketability looming or on the doorstep would be those the phase one commercial uh, core lots, which I'm sure planning's on diligent working on right now, as well as by the end of summer, um, we'll have those residential lots ready to go. Like that's that's why I asked the question because we're about to hit our season out there, and I'd like to have some for sale signs on things for the people that are in that community, like the people that are visiting that community, to be able to see. Like, it, even if we got a, they, what did they have a Brownlee um, title insurance for sellers for developers because of how long the title process is taking these days? You can purchase title insurance and then still proceed and not have to wait for that title to come in in order to sell those lots. So I'd like for sale signs on May long. I, we need to, we need to move on this. <laughs> Councillor, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you. Um, the uh, Shunda Creek Road uh, accessory alignment, what work is being done there what will that involve so that uh, so currently we have a you know basically an offset between the main access road going into Nordic and the Shunda access road the long range plan was to actually have those two intersections timed and that was actually even submitted as I believe in the last uh, 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 traffic impact assessment as the, the long range goal for uh, realignment the, to have a better transition of traffic from the north into the south part of the hamlet is actually to line those two intersections up. The current main entrance to Nordig. Yeah, that's right. So basically it would be the, the Shunda access road would come to the east and there would be access straight across the highway into, into, the, okay. into the hamlet. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sirhan, please. Yeah, just one note that there isn't um, any revenue uh, projections for the lots in those numbers for the due to do from because we don't really have a good solid knowledge of what is there for sale so okay I think we can probably move on out of Nordeg unless there's any other questions go click 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 click
West Country Roads. Um, so just due to the construction costs um, that have increased in, but we've seen for our um, grading projects, we did bump this project down the, down the road. It is funded $300,000 a year annually. Um, there was, I remember a brief discussion at uh, budget deliberations about wanting to revisit that if we wanted to actually increase the amount of annual allocation to that fund that could expedite that uh, project. But I believe the 2027 year, um, I believe it works out pretty close to the fully funded out of the, uh, the West Country Roads Reserve to fund that project in 27. Unless we wanted to add more money to it or we just leave that one as status quo for now. And I'll go to uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. So this would push it out to like 10.8 kilometers then? Uh, right at the, uh, the Ram River Bridge is where the next point, be, the next five kilometers off the end of what's been reconstructed. So we're, we're at about kilometer 19 right now. Oh, okay. So at 24 sorry, I was looking is at the, pavement. the ramp. Oh, sorry, yeah, no, sorry. this is the gravel portion. Okay. And then what happens with that bridge and the realignment of that road up from the bridge that is super dangerous? Yeah, that bridge is expensive. Um, <laughs> you know, the $6 million a year, when we could look at uh, the bridge investment, like that could be one bridge that year to get done. Um, and that's, you know, that's there again, comes back to the conversations with, with, uh, with council was that we do have that flexibility that if we want to take on a project this, that's that large, and that will be the only project we do that year. And the realignment of that road? As we continue to move west, you know, and, um, Have it's, to look at it's been then. in that condition for as long as we can remember, yeah. and we've done leaps and bounds to improve it. Um, I, don't, I don't think that it's a panic to get it completed. There's, there might even be other priorities that come ahead of that now. Um, but that North Fork Road, I've said, since my inception into the industry, I've bounced over that oh, yeah. horrible road right from end to end. <laughs> And it's been great to see the investment that we have done in it. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, my family, we drive it every weekend mm -hmm. <laughs> to go. Yeah. Um, my family operates some wells back there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's definitely done better. But that yeah. ski, steep curve down and then immediate, uh, it's... Oh, yeah. Could use some, some thinking on that. Yeah. Um, so, again, I think that one's funded, so we can probably move on. Ah, resource roads. So um, in light of some newer um, conversations, uh, sounds like we're getting closer to having a second partner. Um, the latest um, estimate there shows our portion to be $2 million still underfunded. Um, so when it comes to, you know, this, this conversation is a, is, a, is a premise to reallocating uh, restricted, unrestricted surplus left over or surplus left over from a previous year or looking at investing in funds. If this road is still the priority, we'd be looking for an additional $2 million just to, to fund our portion of the one third. Um, no other updates from a, the third partner as of, as of yet, but sounds like it's, we're getting closer than ever. Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. So is your goal today for us to try to figure out where our shortfall is coming from? Is that one of the goals? Yeah, that's that's the answer I do not have, is where you can, where is the additional $2, $2 million for our portion going to come from? And we have no residents along that road, just industry. Um, Uh, Councillor Graham. We are still waiting on a third partner for this, so we don't have to do that right now, correct? Or do we want to do that right now? So if the third partner comes, we're ready. You would like to do it? I would like to see us fully funded so that nobody can, like, so we can say we're ready. We are ready. Go. We are not the hold up. Ours is funded. We've, we've kind of said that already. Yes, but <laughs> our paperwork is not proving that now. 
Any additional thoughts? Again, although there are no residences there, that industry that is supported by that road as well funds 82% of our assessment. Yes. So um, we do have some reason to um, put some energies and, and yes. some of the money from the public purse in that area for sure. So, so then should that shortfall come from tax revenue? So that's why I'm, I'm trying to pick a spot that's, is that what you're suggesting? Uh, well, again, that's that's one of the hardest areas to, to extract. That does have a political political factor as well. Um, we have a number of surpluses that are um, <coughs> maybe not needed in the in the immediacy that maybe we could reallocate some from. That may become more obvious as we go through this entire exercise as well, but I think it would be important to find that money that we have committed to, to be able to allow those other partners to be um, um, equally confident that we're, we're there along with them as, as that question comes before us. So that's kind of where my thought pattern is on, on this project. Uh, Councillor Graham? I'm sorry to bring this up, Councillor Sir Mac, but the Burnstick Lake Road paving for 2025 is 2.4 million. That would be, that's not for 2024, but we could readjust that. And the 4 million in 2026 could go somewhere else, or if we were to push it back and take two from there and readjust things there. Just an idea a paved job for a paved job. And I will. We'll share that in the past, as we've had opportunities for paving uh, and favorable um, favorable moments in pricing that we have reallocated in order to move those projects up a bit in the head in the in the um, in the process. Uh, probably something we could do if there is that additional partner for the Ochis Road that we could find somewhere to shift our our um, paving priorities and reserves towards that or go to Las Vegas and play it all in red. <laughs> um, Councillor Cermak, please. Okay, the resource road out there, which the old cheese. Uh, there's two partners in it now and they are us. Uh, uh, us. <laughs> and potentially another partner. But we're only paying for a third, right? <laughs> but when this was initially announced, we had our third, right? Oh, Mr. Mr. Ammons, please. Thank you, Reeve Lawyer. Perhaps Councillor Cermak. Clearwater County, when we created this reserve, was under a funding component of Clearwater County as a municipality, partnered with the province of Alberta and the federal government, a third, a third, a third. Um, we always wanted our third ready to show the importance to the other two higher level governments. Um, given the time, and we've had the conversation even today about inflation, um, that what we had in reserve no longer will cover our third. So we have a shortfall there. Uh, we have had inquiries from one potential partner. Um, they're reaching out to another. So there are discussions, but there's nothing firmed up yet. So this probably won't be happening this year. Hard to say. Oh, okay. It could happen. Or it could be pushed down the road a couple of years yet. It, my feeling, if it comes through, it'll come through fairly quickly. Um, our constraint is going to be the permits that we're required to have. Um, as Eric's pointed out, uh, engineering, design, uh, we're basically tender ready. But our permits are not in play. 
uh, wetland compensation and all the varying permits that are required to build a road these days. So that may be a constraint. Um, if it comes through, I think it'll be within a year. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Northcott. All righty. So the Burnstick Lake Road, that does get busy. There's, there's a lot of uh, recreational users and campers and stuff that do use that, that piece of road. It is very dusty and there's a, yeah. So um, the, the Ochis Road, there's also a lot of families and stuff that drive on that road and, and the community people and industry that use that road as well. But if we're looking for funds in the 2024, just for the high speed internet, there's $3.4 million there. Just saying. Councillor Swanson. All great points, but I would also say that maybe the Burnstick Road is not used year round as much as the Ochis is used round, year round. So we do have emergency services that tend to go to Ochis quite often. So a little higher priority for myself than the Burnstick Road, but yes, there is that option of broadband as well. So, so my comment would be safety at community is always a high priority and um, the use of the Burnstick Lake Road, although it's recreational and that's something that's very important, uh, it, it is recreational. It's an optional, optional use. I don't think it's optional for those communities to use the Ochis Road. I don't think it's optional for industry to use that road. They need to. So ultimately, if we're, we're factoring in the safety of community and the safety of business as as it uses our roads, I think a high priority has to be taken to those roads that are the, uh, there's no choice but to use those roads for those communities and that bit those businesses out at the Ochis, just from my view anyway. Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I, I agree with uh, um, Councillor Graham and um, the Reeve, um, but I'm also looking at our color-coded thing here. And um, down to 2024 and where it's sitting, all the numbers are sitting here. Is it possible for that extra requirement to come out of PW Gravel? And we can refund that um, when we rejig a budget? Like, is it possible to look at that coming out of there now and look at refunding that as projects are needed normally this time of year after our our auditors have been in. We also have to look at reallocations from the year before, et cetera. Like we do have some options, whereas today we can make, we can shift that over and then look at reallocating after the auditors are done with our 2022. Mr. Emmons. Thank you. The, the gravel, I'd be apprehensive um, simply because again, it, it's almost a Nordic structure. It's a do to do from, okay. um, so it's a reclamation liability. No, I'm, the there's two. Yeah. There's a gravel and then there's a gravel reclamation. Yeah, there's wouldn't two. Want to. I wouldn't want to touch the reclamation either, but the gravel one. But that's what I'm saying about oh. the do, 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 to, do from. One's a reclamation. The other one is the capital investment, the enhancing of the gravel pits, the purchasing, purchasing the, you know, so it, it it's, it's taking from the ability to meet council's policy to supply and secure um, proper and adequate gravel resources for the future of road development. Um, that one is very operationally based. Okay. Doesn't even look like it's used past 2024. I guess, yeah, I guess I was just kind of recognizing the purpose of that reserve was to uh, purchase and develop new gravel. Uh, it was my understanding that we had a hundred year your source and I'm looking how many terms in the future when I get a hundred years of if that's going to be my decision uh, 15 terms from now but uh, but uh, I mean if we have to look at things that we need to priorities we have to set now um, and you know not saying that gravel or a hundred the, the needs of gravel a hundred years from now is not important I, I believe it is that's why we set a reserve for that but if we have to meet the needs of the safety of the community there and we have to um, 
um, temporarily extract some some pressure or some um, supports to one part of our budget. Maybe this is one that we can um, delay unless we have a impending purchase yeah. of a pit or something that we need to do. Just just a just a thought, anyway. Well, and it doesn't mean it can't be refunded later. Like, but it seems like a decent option I, I, now. And I would just say that in the past, if we if there's been an opportunity that's come forward, perhaps for purchasing a building that meets yeah. some of our administrative needs, we've been able to reallocate and put money there. Um, you know, to be able to take advantage of an opportunity that came up for say a. a land that would be suitable for gravel in the right place. And, yeah. um, I think those are things that can be brought forward as the need arises and the opportunity arises. Well, and then we're not cutting a project to do another project. Like, we can still accomplish both, potentially. Ms. Sirhan, please. Yeah, so I think um, identifying the specific, the specific restricted surplus um, maybe is, um, I think, Director Hansen's indicated that they're going to come from the restricted surplus of paving. Is that for which one? Sorry. For either one of those, Burnstick Lake and the. Um, oh no, the Ochis has a separate one. Sorry. Yeah. So um, it's a resource. So I think we're underfunded regardless for Burnstick. So the paving, the paving is restricted plus is underfunded to even do Burnstick. Um, so you have the parking lot started there as, as your funding deficiencies. It sounds like this one should be put there. And then yes. when we get to the end, you start actually quantifying all of these and maybe part of a larger conversation instead of trying to pick one out here today. Yeah, I, I think understand no cheese is big. But. Yeah, and we have to prioritize which um, projects are the most important and then uh, identify the, the shortfall of tax revenue because ultimately that's how these are going to be funded, right? Um, and how much uh, the community purse can bear. As as much as we would like things to be funded through grant revenue, um, there just is that availability just isn't there anymore. Uh, we do our best, and there are uh, specific projects that do qualify occasionally, but for the most part, these projects are going to need to be funded through tax revenue. And the tax revenue will flow into the restricted surplus and then um, the priorities will need to be set and the, the, the first priorities will be done first and the second priorities will be done second. And that's, that's kind of where we need to get to as far as identifying specific restricted surpluses today. I don't think that's necessary, but we'll, we need to know um, how, what the tax revenue stream is going to look like coming forward and um, to, to accomplish all of the priorities and um, yeah, then the decisions will need to be made as far as which, which ones are actually priorities and for which years once we can identify what the shortfall of tax revenue is. And Council, oh, uh, Mr. Hagen. Thank you, Reeve Lloyd. Um, yeah, just further to that, um, the reason that this meeting is critical over the next couple of days right now is essentially for two reasons. One, we are currently finalizing the financial statements for 2022. So we need um, this committee's recommendation to council in terms of what those reserve transfers should look like, those transfers to restricted surplus based on the 22 year end. So those can be incorporated into the financial statements. And then secondly, Ms. Sirhan's going to be and is already working on the draft tax rate bylaw for council's consideration. So that's coming up and there's an impact on there too. So this is where all of these, these lines converge and, and come together here. Um, just as additional information as well, uh, we will be talking about broadband either later today or tomorrow. And that's not a funding option right now because it's not funded either. So that's going to be another priority setting and funding decision for the committee to discuss. And uh, with that, Councillor Cermak. Yeah, I just want to go back to Burns. Dick Lake Road. Um, there is a village out there at the end of the road that is residents year-round. There's about 35 residents out there. They use that road every day. I think we might be talking to some of those folks later on. Yes. 
We will be. Just, yeah, just to say, just to put that out there. Yeah. That's why we're going to have the conversation to partner with them on that road. Okay. We move on from resource roads. It only gets better. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went through the so exercise there it over is the past week, week and a half, and, and it, it only gets oh, better. Mr. Ammons. Thank you, Reply. So I just wanted to remind the committee and maybe uh, administration team, we do have an emergency management meeting at 3 o'clock. I do. So That's why I was pushing forward without a break. So I thought we'd get close as close as we can near the end of the day and then we'll take a break in between those two two scheduled uh, events today so uh, Does it travel anywhere or is it here I, I, I believe the the second one is here is, is it not yes and I, is there a virtual component to that one too or are they I think last time they were virtually but this time no okay Emergency management stuff, not us. How's Wednesday look for you? <laughs> sure, so sorry with for that. Please, please continue. Okay, I see the next one is construction equipment, and I will defer to Mr. Magnus there for that one. Okay, thank you, Eric. So the next three construction equipment, general equipment, and uh, vehicles light and heavy duty uh, is under the realm of public works operations in regards to the acquisition of these pieces of equipment over the next 10 years. So um, currently we contribute 150,000 a year into this particular restricted surplus fund. Um, and as of right now, we're sitting at uh, just a little over 5900000 in regards to that, uh, that uh, particular fund. And at the current rate, if we don't continue to top off that particular fund, we will be depleted by the end of 2027. The... What we've done in the past is use this fund to uh, restricted surplus to fund the large ticket items. And by that I mean when I say construction equipment, large ticket items, that's your packers, graders, loaders, and in this case, the landfill dozer. Um, so we do have a replacement plan in place uh, and a policy was approved by council along with the fleet equipment management plan and to the best of our ability uh, obviously accounting for some discretion uh, we follow that plan and uh, um, replace these pieces of equipment when needed so if I just move ahead to uh, the next one and I'll just sort of do an overall so general equipment in this case incorporates your uh, typically your trailers, your larger type trailers, your low boy trailer, and in this case also the solid waste walking floor trailer. Uh, those are the typically the two that need to be replaced. And then when it comes to vehicles, uh, both light duty and heavy duty, what we're looking at here is your plow trucks, your highway tractor unit. We have one highway tractor unit, our picker truck. And in the future, and this will be further evaluated, what we call a self-propelled asphalt sprayer. Um, and I throw that in there, just the long short of it is, uh, as we continue, as council continues to move forward with uh, paving of additional roads, that puts a strain on us in regards to uh, the maintenance of these uh, surface roads. So we continue to look at how we can maintain that service level uh, and meet those service levels that are, are currently in place uh, and some of the efficiencies there uh, on top of um, just bringing on additional personnel, additional crews okay, as the uh, number of kilometers increase, but also at particular pieces of equipment that might uh, assist us 
and maintaining that service level. And that's, that's a typical piece of equipment where um, long short of it, you know, you sit there, you see them on the highways and it's an individual sitting in this vehicle and they have this uh, remote control where they can uh, manage a boom, which does the spray patching and so on, right? Um, so, but uh, again, we're continuing looking at, at various ways of keeping that service level up there. Anyways, the, um, we were tasked as administration of what, what it is that we need to do to contribute on a yearly basis over the next 10 years so as to sustain this restricted surplus and therefore provide the necessary funds over the next 10 years to uh, maintain the course in regards to paying for these big ticket items. And we're looking at 1.2 million per year. If we put away 1.2 million per year, so approximately million fifty thousand more on top of added on to 150,000 a year, that will sustain us over the next 10 years accounting for inflation. We try to build that into the cost of equipment itself as the years go by in terms of uh, what kind of increase we could see in that piece of equipment. And that would leave you at year 2033 at about just shy of 570,000 remaining in that fund, okay, if we maintain the current replacement plan. Any questions on that? Deputy Reeve Melhoff first. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Well, the number sounds scary, but it, I think that it's great that you've done the background work to know what that should be. Like, for, like, for example, the Bear Fire Master Plan, they are going with the 800,000 being you know, semi-sustainable because obviously that's old, so it also needs to potentially be looked at. Um, but I think it goes to show that we need to do the same thing for public works. And that's how we can not have a future council's budget set up to go, okay, where is this coming from? We already know where it's coming from. It's been pre-funded and based on existing policy. So thank you for the background work done on this. Well, and Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you. Do we have any information that would allow us to adjust our replacement policy? The policy in place is continually reviewed every year, and our, our uh, so the fleet equipment management plan, it is a fluid document in regards to having, giving us the ability to review it. So we do, uh, in terms of uh, uh, continue to maintain that communication with the, with the various manufacturers in regards to uh, their warranty uh, uh, in place and so on. So we evaluate that on a continued basis. Yeah, I was wondering if other municipalities have policies that are, are somewhat different that um, would provide information. When we built this as a team, we uh, uh, reached out to a number of other municipalities and looked at what they had in place. So ours is in line with, with uh, the majority of the other municipalities that we were in contact with. Okay, okay. thank you. Any additional questions? Not seeing any at this moment, so if, if you would uh, continue. Uh, next one is uh, uh, pertains to solid waste and recycling. Uh, Eric, do you want to do any comments on any of these? Um, you know, I guess one thing that's important, I think uh, you'll find that the restricted surplus that's been identified for the solid waste as well as the, the balance of the utilities um, hasn't been a historic um, uh, restricted surplus uh, itemized for this. So again, typically they would have been just uh, funded through tax revenue annually. These have been uh, earmarked now to come from a core infrastructure um, uh, restricted surplus. So um, if we go past this one, this really comes out of a, a, a study that, uh, that uh, we recently received from uh, Tetra Tech. Um, it's going to really start, um, you know, they've, they've come in a couple times now, they even made presentations to council of what the 10-year the plan is for solid waste in, in our municipality. 
And there's a very significant build that's been itemized within the next two years of um, six and a half million dollars there for a central site. Um, so $500,000, I believe, has is, is been earmarked for as early as 2024. And then uh, the, the build to commence in 2025, likely be completed over two years, but um, budget the entire amount in the first year, see how far we get, and then whatever work in progress it would get completed there. So um, I believe the plan was to bring that report back to council for consideration, but lends itself well to this conversation of um, that project was under un, unfunded. About six and a half million dollars does not have a, a restricted surplus previous plan to support its development because you know, I can tell you five years ago we weren't there. We were still had a regional partner. So, um, so this is new and when it comes to um, demolition of some of the sites, uh, maybe that's an operating cost, but the enhancement of some of these other sites there over the 10 year plan of, of the solid waste plan um, was encapsulated in this in this report, which will be coming back to council. But, um, there again, throughout the years, um, not an identified source other than the core infrastructure and that we can, we can provide a summary of what would need to go into that reserve. Um, or that restricted surplus to say in order to fund all that, um, but that plan has not been developed as of yet. And I'll go to Councillor Graham. Firstly, I'm curious because I cannot figure it out in my darn brain. What does WTFS stand for? Waste Transfer Facility Site? Okay. Um, secondly, I personally don't agree with doing the central site. I think it's a huge overbuild and we could do something much smaller and more, more price efficient for that. So I would be happy to change that, I guess. I don't know. And I'll go to uh, Deputy Reed Mailhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, the one thing that I worry about when we're making sure that we fund all the, the, the savings accounts for all of the upcoming projects um, is the grant funding opportunities that may be lost. If we've pre-funded everything, where would be the encouragement for provincial or federal partners? If, we're, if they're like, hey, yeah, you guys are good to go already. Like, why would they want to give us grants to encourage us to do some of these projects? Um, that's my only worry with always, always be pre-setting and pre-doing these programs because maybe then we won't get the partnerships that we're looking for in our provincial and federal grants. Um, I agree with you when it comes to the central site. I also, I'm not a fan of the location also. Um, some of our best ag land and we're going to put a landfill there. I, I'm not a, because this would be at the north quarter, correct? Or have we not discussed that ever? My assumption is it would be where it currently is. That's, to summarize the report, the, that's exactly what Yeah, that's what I thought it's, the it's report the, said. It's a location of convenience. It's, it's there. It's become socially acceptable, um, generally to the, to the area, which is hard to sell sometimes for a, a waste transfer site. Um, but, of course, I've, I've come through quite late in the process here. Yeah. So I'll get Kurt to speak to um, well, the work that was done prior or... When the study was presented to us, we were told, because I asked specifically, because it was presented council, live streamed, I asked why that was the chosen location, and they said simply ownership. So we didn't look at where the best location truly is. We looked at what does Clearwater County own, and where is the best location based on what Clearwater County owns. I don't think that's a way you determine best location for something. It's where is truly the best location, not what we own di dictates that. I, Mr. Emmons, please. So if I may, and then hopefully it provides some comfort um, for, for council. The other part is this quarter section, because it's not only because it's owned by Clearwater County, it's inside the intermunicipal development plan area. Um, so it, it, although it's currently zoned ag, the long-term land use planning document states that it would not be um, because it's inside the intermunicipal de development plan for the projected growth of the town of Rocky Mountain House. So it, it, which is another reason why this quarter section was picked back in the day, um, if that helps. Um, 
Go, I'll go to Councillor Ratcliffe and then back to you, Jenny. Okay. As I continue to get comments from the district that uh, they don't like that location, that it's not convenient. I guess, yeah, go ahead, Jenny. The inter I know, yes, it's within the intermunicipal development area, but when we are looking at building that, when that area structure plan development area was imagined was a central facility for waste transfer ever on the list, so then this probably wouldn't be a good location based on the intermunicipal development area. Or if we asked our partner if that's where we should be putting a solid waste transfer facility, we did it in emergent because we had to, we needed to come up with a space, but the long range vision of that development area, does it include a solid waste facility of this scale? Probably not. It, oh, what did it include, uh, Deputy Reed-Mahoff, was land use. So not specifically a transfer site, uh, but industrial, commercial, it just went into designations. So it didn't sp specify, it only specified uses. Thank you. You're welcome. And if, if I'm, oh, uh, Mr. Hagan, please. Thank you, Reeve. I'll be brief. I just wanted to provide some clarification around the concerns about uh, losing potential grant revenue because we have money saved. Um, in my experience, granting bodies don't typically look at need, financial need. Um, and I've never seen a situation where an organization such as this would be penalized for astute financial planning. And, and putting that away. And keeping in mind, there's very few grant opportunities outside of MSI and the gas funds, that sort of thing. And they do not look at, you know, what do we currently have available? So I think the risk of losing any grants that way um, for good planning is very minimal. And uh, just so I'm clear, a part of this idea or concept of a central waste transfer is the decommissioning of one or more other existing waste transfers? Is that, uh, I'll go to Mr. Magnus for that. Yeah, so just to add an additional point, and then I'll, I'll address your question there, Reeve Lougheed. Um, Mr. Hansen did indicate in regards to the solid waste master management plan, that is now a completed document, and it will be put on the website, our county's website. And, and it, it outlines in detail in regards to, to uh, the implementation of all the salt waste and recycling uh, uh, plan in regards to transfer station set. So that leads me to Reeve Lougheed's uh, question. Yes, currently we have 10 transfer stations. So if council so chooses to move in the direction of, of implementing the entirety of the recommendations put forward by this uh, management plan, we would uh, move from 10 to seven transfer stations. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Northcott? I didn't, but. Okay, and I know our uh, time is winding down for today and there's no good place for me to press the, the pause button here, but I'm going to be, unless there's a, a point that we need to make at the end of the day here, um, I'm gonna be pressing that pause button. So, um, Kind of one round of last questions or, or comments if uh, before I press that pause button. Okay, so with that, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Deputy Reed Melhoff. I assume that's why he said press your pause button because he saw me press my button. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, <laughs> I think this goes to show the fact that we probably need, before we actually fund um, the solid waste, solid waste central site, we need to have a, a bigger conversation. Um, anyway, so hopefully that can happen before that is actually funded, because I don't want to have to do that in December when we're trying to compile budget. So with that, I will press the pause button and we will go into recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us all today and thank you for your help.